Okay, let's get started. Two minutes late, but better late than never. And hopefully it's more reliable because I closed many, many windows here. Although I can never tell if it's better to have more windows or less windows to be reliable. That's, that's one of the problems we have in systems today. We cannot make sense out of them, right? It'd be nice if we could actually figure out why this is running slow automatically, but we still don't have that solution yet, I think even as computer engineers or computer scientists. <laughs> okay, uh, so we'll continue. Can everybody hear me well? Is there an echo there? It's okay? Okay, good. We'll continue the low latency uh, trend that we've started. We'll talk about low latency DRAM, and we'll transition into processing in memory, which has a lot to do with low latency as well as low energy. Okay, this is a very quick summary of the last lecture. We talked about DRAM operation, we talked about memory control and how difficult it is. We talked about reinforcement learning based memory controllers to make life a little bit easier, hopefully. And we talked about some memory scheduling policies, the simplistic ones, but we're going to cover that later on when we talk about resource management, more sophisticated policies. Uh, and we started on memory latency, especially on reduced latency uh, DRAM, and we're going to continue. Remember, we talked about tiered latency DRAM. The key idea of tiered latency DRAM in five words is really segmenting the bit lines. That's three words. <laughs> you segment the bit lines such that you have a portion of DRAM that's low latency and another portion that enables you to give the high capacity as opposed to have a single long bit line, right? And then you have a memory that you can manage to, uh, such that you can put frequently used or latency critical data to that low latency portion within DRAM. You can manage it as a cache, or you can manage it as part of your main memory. So it's basically it's a substrate uh, that can that can do a lot for you. Okay, today we're going to continue memory latency, and we're going to actually uh, look at different relationships. Uh, this is one of my favorites uh, to talk about uh, the uh, relationship between latency, voltage, and reliability. And this will hopefully give you an idea. And this is very fundamental, also. That's true for many many memories, not just DRAM. Even though we're talking about uh, DRAM in, the, in these lectures, um, it, 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 uh, it, it will give you a context of how complicated things can get and what levers you can play uh, in memory uh, to change different things. So it'll be fun. And then we'll transition into processing in memory, as I mentioned. So this is the title from last time when we started. And rem remember this nice, beautiful graph. Maybe that will change starting 2020. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to, that's just to uh, jog your memory. But remember, we were talking about this. Why do we have the long latency in main memory, uh, in DRAM in particular? But this is, again, true for many other memories. Uh, and we talked about one reason, design of DRAM microarchitecture. It's really not optimized for latency, very partially optimized for latency, but it's dominantly optimized for capacity per area. In fact, so much so that if you uh, talk to a DRAM manufacturer, let's say a few years ago, and if you suggested to them uh, some change to the DRAM microarchitecture that would reduce latency significantly, but it would cost them in terms of area, like tiered latency DRAM, 3%, they would kick you out of the room, probably. Because they, they are really, their mindset is very cost, cost, cost. I want to improve capacity. I don't care about anything else, almost, almost. <laughs> So that's, uh, that needs to change, and I, I believe that's changing, uh, as we will talk about later uh, in this lecture. So they're still very, uh, DRAM manufacturers are very much cost-driven today, partially because of the evolution of the market, right? And partially because of the way we view uh, storage and memory in the system design. They're not intelligent agents today, right? They're more like dumb slaves that store data. As a result, dumb slaves need to cost little. Right. Unfortunately, I don't want to make this analogy more political than it, it needs to be, but essentially, uh, that's what it is. That's, that's the way, way we have seen, uh, that's the way we have seen uh, storage and memory. But that, uh, later in this lecture, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to re uh, cha challenge that assumption also. Uh, so par uh, the, the cost uh, optimization is partially because of the mindset and partially because of the market and the way it's uh, evolved. Okay. Uh, but there's another reason uh, uh, why we have uh, long latency, and that's because uh, the way we look at latency, and that's, again, a mindset issue. Uh, so basically today, 
uh, even without changing the DRM microarchitecture, perhaps we can do things that can reduce the latency. So this is good because it's a low cost, but we'll examine some trade-offs as well. So today, uh, when we specify the DRM latencies, yes, we have very different timing parameters for different operations in DRM, but we don't have different timing parameters for different temperatures, for example, or different DRM chips, or different parts of a DRM chip, or different supply voltage levels, or maybe different application data. Maybe some application data can tolerate some errors if you actually access things with low latency, right? Today, everything is fixed latency, and we're going to challenge that uh, right now. So uh, this is a view of DRM latency, low, high, and there's significant variation across different chips because of heterogeneous manufacturing conditions, also because of uh, operating conditions as well. And also there is a significant variation within a chip, again, because of uh, manufacturing conditions and operating conditions. Uh, well, let's take a look at the, basically within a chip there are some slow cells and there are some large cells. So today DRM latency is specified in the DRM standards, but this doesn't reflect the true device latency when you look at a particular device or a particular cell. Why is that? One, is the, one reason is there's imperfect manufacturing process we will talk about. There's significant variation in terms of latency. And this is true. You can actually expand this very fundamental again because you cannot perfectly manufacture everything to be exactly the same in terms of access time, refresh, power, dot, dot, dot. Things are different by nature. Right? That's heterogeneity. Uh, and that causes latency variation also. This is, this is, uh, the, this is the exact... Uh, the same reason why we had variation in terms of retention times that we exploited earlier, right? In that sense, uh, the key idea is going to be very similar. We're going to exploit the late variation in terms of latency as opposed to retention times. So basically, that manufacturing process causes this latency variation. Some DRAM chips are slow, or the slowest cell in some DRAM chips are slower, uh, slower than other, the slowest cell in other DRAM chips. And within a DRAM chip, you get some sort of distribution. This is just <laughs> a normal distribution, if you will. Some, some cells are uh, uh, slow. Some cells are actually fast. Actually, fast is this part. Slow is this part. Latency is high. But the standard latency is specified in the standard such that it's higher than some number of DRAM cells, uh, some, some number of DRAMs that are manufactured or some... Uh, it's, it's set to a level such that manufacturers can comfortably manufacture a lot of DRAM reliably, and they don't need to throw away the chips because the latency happens to be here. <laughs> Does that make sense? So this standard latency was really ch chosen to increase yield. There are also other political issues because this, there's a standard co corporation called JEDEC where these things are decided, but mainly things are driven by the yield and economics. So if you look at this, you set the standard latency at, I don't know, 50 nanoseconds over here, and this chip actually, the slowest cell operates at 20 nanoseconds. Well, there's a huge margin, right, that is not being exploited. So we're going to talk about that margin. And there's also a temperature, actually, uh, which we haven't even looked at. There's variation that's uh, caused because of different devices and different... Uh, different things, uh, different cells within a device, but there's also a variation because of the operating conditions. At different, uh, these devices or parts of the devices may be operating at different temperatures, and they may not be operating at the worst case temperature. So standard latency are actually, is actually chosen for operation at the worst specified possible temperature of DRAM, which is 85 degrees Celsius, which is pretty high, actually. <laughs> okay, so basically, uh, one of the other reasons for the long memory latency is conservative timing margins, which is essentially this margin that you get from here to here, right? Uh, and DRAM timing parameters are set to cover the worst case to optimize yield. One example is worst case temperature, 85 degrees, whereas your DRAM may be operating at 40 degrees Celsius, or you may be aggressively cooling your system, right? Uh, and this enables a wide range of operating conditions without requiring uh, thinking about latency, right? And worst case devices also, a DRAM cell with the smallest charge across any acceptable device determines uh, your uh, latency, standard latency, basically. And this enables the manufacturers to tolerate process variation while they're delivering acceptable yield of chips. Because if they have to throw away a lot of the chips, they lose a lot of money, right? Okay, so this leads to large timing margins for the common case, and we're going to examine uh, those common cases. So let's understand and exploit variation in DRAM latency. And similar things happen, actually, in uh, other memories also, flash memory as well, but we understand DRAM much better today. So 
this, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but these are some other uh, things that you can see where we've seen this operation many times, right? DRAM cell, sense amplifier, and there are three steps of charge movement. You activate the row, which brings the data into sense amplifier that is sensing, and then after sensing, sense amplifier restores the data, and then after that you pre-charge. These are the three major operations. And if we look at, if we plot DRAM charge over time by looking at just one cell, this is time, this is the charge level, Initially, let's assume that it's fully charged. And sense amplifier, remember, it's at VDD over 2 so to sense this. When you activate, cell actually loses some data, and sense amplifier starts sensing that data. And at some point, sense amplifier kicks in because it's enabled, because it sensed something. And then it starts driving the data, restores the cell, and the bit line uh, also becomes VDD, because initially this was charged. And basically, in theory, uh, that's how long it should take so that you can start pre-charging this, right? Uh, this, this array so that for next access. But in practice, there's a timing margin. <laughs> and that's the timing margin that people add. And this timing margin depends on the cell, depends on the chip, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so why do we have the extra timing margin? Certainly, one, uh, one reason is it's reliability, right? Uh, uh, but uh, if you know that the cell can be accessed fast, why do you... Uh, uh, well, why, why should you have the timing margin? So there are two reasons for timing margin. One is process variation. I already said this, actually, but we're going to look at it in more detail. And the other is temperature dependence. First reason, DRAM cells are not equal. Right? They're all different. This leads to extra timing margin for a cell that can store more charge than others. Right? So let's take a look at the ideal. Ideal is this perfect manufacturing. Very, very, very hard to achieve. I haven't seen any perfect manufacturing for anything, really. Uh, and re reality is like this, maybe. Different size, different charge, different latency. The key is, because of the size, you have different amount of charge. And the ability to move the charge also through the access transistor. So, for example, you have a small cell over here and the large cell over here. You have large variation, large variation charge, and access latency. Because the cell is large, it can be accessed faster because it can, you can basically do all of those operations that I showed you in the cell operation much, much quicker because charge moves fast over here, whereas this one, is, it takes longer to sense, for example, right? It, it takes longer to restore as well. So this is a view of the DRAM uh, cell. If you all remember, this was 3D, right? This is like a 3D picture, and the access transistor is on top of it. Uh, and to be able to access it, that's what you need to do. Uh, so you have cell capacitance. There are three things over here. The cell capacitance, there's contact resistance over here with the, between the capacitor and the transistor. And there's a transistor over here which has its own met parameters for performance. It has its own capacit capacitance and resistance, right? So a small cell can store small charge. It can have small capacitance. It can have high contact resistance, for example, that actually uh, limits the movement of charge. As a result, you may access it slowly. And you may also have a slow access transistor. You may be unlucky as a cell, right? So these, all of these things vary when you manufacture it. As a result, you get different latencies. And it's very hard to actually figure out exactly, model this exactly. Uh, although people try to do circuit simulations and uh, add variation to the circuit simulation using Monte Carlo simulations, for example, and try to figure out what are the boundaries uh, when they actually try to evaluate at the circuit level. OK, so a small cell doesn't mean it's just small. It also means potentially high contact resistance. So it's actually slow cell. It should be called a slow cell, really. But small is a nice <laughs> abstraction uh, that I use. A large cell can store and move a lot of charge. A small cell can store and move little charge or charge uh, slowly. OK. The other is temperature dependence. And you know already that DRAM leaks more charge at higher temperature, which means that by nature, you should have less charge if you're operating at high temperature. And if you have less charge, it's slower, right? <laughs> So this leads to extra timing margin for cells that operate at low temperature, because at low temperature, you'll have large, a lot of charge uh, in the cell. So let's take a look at this. This is room temperature, for example. It's cold. This is hot temperature, 85 degrees Celsius. Here you have small leakage. Here you have large leakage. And um, well, I said that. Uh, as a result, you have large variation in access latency. So theoretically, this should be much faster. You can operate this much faster than this one, right? because you have a lot more charge. Make sense? They're all intuitive, right? But the problem is DRAM timing parameters are dictated by the worst case, 
and I already said this, the smallest charge, uh, the cell, dictated by the smallest cell with the smallest charge in all DRM products, or acceptable DRM product to reach some yield, uh, operating at the highest temperature. Uh, and that leads to large timing margin for the common case. So the key idea of one of the things that we, I will describe and I'll give you some results for in adaptive late DRM is obvious after you know this. It's optimizing time, DRM timing for the common case. So what is common case? Current temperature, current DRM module. <laughs> right. So basically you specify some timings uh, for each DRM module and for maybe different temperatures. Let's say two temperatures, 55 degrees Celsius and 85 degrees Celsius. So if you're below 55 degrees Celsius, you use the timing uh, parameters that are low latency. If you're operating above 55 degrees Celsius, you use the normal timing parameters that are already there. So that's low cost, hopefully. So why would this reduce latency? Because of this, I've already said this. Uh, so more charge in a DRM cell leads to faster sensing, charge restoration, and pre-charging. Okay, and faster access, basically, in the end. Uh, okay, let me see if I, I've covered most of this, but basically this says extra charge means reduced latency. Why? Because it enables lower, uh, you can sense cells with extra charge faster. Remember that picture? Everything happens earlier. Uh, the sense amplifier kicks in much earlier for those cells. Uh, so you get lower sensing latency, yes? Yes, you should press that. Okay, so I have two questions. First of all, how manufacturers uh, detect uh, latency per cell? How today? is it possible? Yeah. Well, today what they do is they basically test uh, uh, oh, for, for this uh, me mechanism. Well, we'll get back to that. Okay. Today they basically have one standard and they ensure that they operate at that standard. And my other question is, uh, yesterday you told us there's like a little chip on the module that communicates with the controller and mm -hmm. decides on um, timings and whatever. That's right. Mm -hmm. So if it's fixed, why do they put that chip to communicate so with it's, the controller? Uh, it's, um, it's, mm, so that thing, uh, the timing is fixed for a given standard DRAM, but if you actually plug in some different type of DRAM that has different timing parameters, for example, let's say DDR3 versus DDR4, you have different timing parameters. Okay, so that chip uh, kind of says like I'm uh, DDR4 or DDR3. It can also give the timing parameters. It really depends on the protocol. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense? Okay. Yeah. So that chip is where you can actually store much more information uh, if you want to implement this. Okay. Okay. So if you want to restore the charge, uh, okay, if you have extra charge, again, you don't need to fully restore charge, uh, cells with extra charge because they already, they already have a lot of charge, right? Uh, so you can reduce the restoration latency. And also pre-charging, you don't need to fully pre-charge the bit lines for cells with extra charge. Does that make sense? Because they can perturb those uh, bit lines very easily. The difficulty is if a cell has very, very small charge, that the, the perturbation it causes is much less than the bigger cells. Okay, so to study this, uh, you need some infrastructure. So remember, we were talking about evaluation methodologies. How do you study, for example, this variation in uh, DRAM cells? Well, uh, you could potentially choose a circuit-level simulation, but the results you get will not be very uh, realistic, if you will. So it's the easiest way to study is really building a system where you can actually test the DRAM and figure out the components. And this is the soft MC, which we have discussed earlier. And one of your TAs, Hassan, actually developed this. He was the lead author, so you can ask him questions about that. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at some results with the experimental infrastructure. So faster sensing. This is TRCD, remember? You activate, so you have more charge, stronger charge flow if you're operating at low temperature. So we want to look at just low temperature at the moment. And that leads to faster sensing. So if you, look at, if you test a bunch of dims, in this case 115, it turns out on average you can reduce the uh, TRCD parameter by 17% without getting any errors in the system, assuming you're operating at low temperature. So that's experimental evidence for the fact that charge correlates uh, with, uh, more charge correlates with uh, reduced latency or faster access. Okay. And the second is restoration time. You can actually, again, modify the res restoration time, remember? Uh, and uh, if you have less, less uh, you, uh, at, at low temperature, you have less leakage. As a result, you have extra charge, which means that you don't need to fully restore charge. And restoration time, if you remember, is the TRS, read latency. 
And it turns out in real DRAM chips, you can reduce the restoration time by 37% and the write recovery time, which we didn't talk about, but it's really a restoration time for writes. Whenever you write to a cell, you need to wait for a while such that the value gets propagated into the cell. Uh, and you can actually reduce that latency by about 50% without any errors again on all of these chips. Okay. So there's also more, but I'm not going to talk about that. So we've discussed the idea. So now let's talk about how you potentially uh, implement it. So you need two components, right? And again, this is one potential implementation of the idea. For example, DRAM manufacturer may provide multiple sets of reliable timing parameters at different temperatures for each step. Let's say two, 55 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Celsius. Uh, and the system monitors DRAM temperature and uses appropriate DRAM timing parameters depending on what temperature you're operating at. That sounds simple, right? So DRAM temperature, how do you monitor it? Well, you need a temperature monitor. It actually exists uh, in, in existing DRAM modules. Uh, and the second one, perhaps a little bit harder, is how do you provide the reliable timing parameters, which is your question, basically. How does the DRAM manufacturer figure out? Well, the DRAM manufacturer needs to do a lot of testing anyway, so they need to figure out uh, what operates uh, within that acceptable latency today at 85 degrees Celsius, so they need to do a little bit more testing. So that's the cost of this mechanism. So, uh, somebody needs to do more testing to figure out the reliable operation latency. Okay, so... You may also have a question, like, is DRAM temperature, uh, what is the DRAM temperature that you observe in real systems? Uh, this is actually something that you can do measurements of, perhaps. Uh, but it turns out, uh, usually, you operate DRAM at low temperatures. So we've done some studies where we have found that things operate at very low temperatures, actually. <laughs> it's not that easy to heat things up unless you have a heating source next to DRAM. Either your ambient temperature is very high, or something is really causing temperature to increase. Right. Usually in server and desktop systems, there is not something that's causing the temperature to increase significantly. In fact, processor use tends to be much hotter because you're doing more computation. And memory tends to be less hot because just because of the sheer fact that you have a lot of capacity and you're not really doing a lot in it. Right. Whereas in the processor, you may be doing a lot. Uh, now, we may want to change that later on, so <laughs> think about the processing and memory part later on. Okay, but DRAM standard is optimized for 85 degrees Celsius. And actually, there are a bunch of work that report that DRAM temperature is relatively low. And there are a bunch of work that says you should keep the DRAM temperature low, or in general, temperature low in your systems, so that you don't uh, lead to reliability issues, right? Uh, but we're not going to talk about it. If you're interested in temperature-related issues, these are some references that you can, uh, you can look at. Okay. So in the common case, in many cases at least, DRAM operates at low temperature. But of course, you cannot rely on that uh, always. So you need to have uh, a backup mechanism, which is a temperature, uh, timing parameters that are optimized for some other temperature than 55 degrees or whatever you choose to be the low temperature. Okay, so this is a summary that I've already shown you, actually. This is what, um, how much you can reduce uh, the different parameters. Let's take a look at the impact of this on system performance. So how do you do that? Well, you could actually simulate using these parameters. So by the way, I'm, I'm giving you these numbers over here, but this is average, right? There's actually a large variation across chips, which I should have put, but you can look at the paper to see the variation across the chips. Some DIMMs actually uh, uh, do, do not, uh, for example, the sensing latency uh, at 55 degrees Celsius, the reliable sensing latency at 55 degrees Celsius for some DIMMs may be 5% only reduction compared to the baseline. But some, for some other DIMMs, it could be 30%. This is just the broad average across 115 of them. Okay, so uh, the way uh, we evaluated this, uh, my student Donkriak actually did the experiments. It turns out in some real memory controllers, you can change the timings. Actually, this is nothing new. How many of you are hardcore gamers here? Used to, hardcore. <laughs> Used to, okay. So have you ever played with the frequency? of your DRAM, of your machine clock? No? Not the processor? Okay, yeah, there you go. So he's, he's a hardcore gamer. <laughs> but you haven't uh, played with the DRAM, so you're not hardcore enough maybe in the, <laughs> in the, in the grand scheme of all gamers. <laughs> yeah, but basically you can play with these timings uh, and you can change in the BIOS uh, the timings. So this is not dynamic, uh, meaning if you play with the timings, and if you reduce it, you may actually get errors, right? 
And that's true for processor frequency also. A lot of, t uh, a lot of gamers, for example, overclock their processors because they really need the performance. Actually, if you want to look at uh, people who really need performance, those, are you those tend to be the hardcore gamers who play these extremely intensive games in, in terms of everything almost, right? In terms of uh, AI, uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know, video, in terms of how fast response time they need. All of those actually stress the system, and that's why gamers are the ones who do these, oh, this kind of overclocking in general. But you could potentially do that, do that as a gamer, but we're not... Pro uh, so, in a sense, uh, what I've described so far, other, potentially, the, the really hardcore gamers would be able to tell you also. But you could do it only statically, meaning that you need to somehow ensure that you don't get errors. Uh, but some gamers may not care about the errors because if there's a pixel that changed in their screen, maybe you don't care, right? As long as you're, you're running fast. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. Uh, so we uh, changed uh, the parameters uh, such that uh, they are set to the timing parameter reductions we found for the given dim. Uh, at 55 degrees Celsius, and we ensured that things didn't run uh, hotter than 55 degrees Celsius, which was easy, as you can see before, uh, in the before, uh, previous result I presented. So basically, you can run real workloads by changing the timing parameters to be lower. And let's see the effect of this on real workloads. Um, and this is single core, single core workloads. This is performance improvement, real performance. Uh, and it turns out, so if you're, if you're not accessing memory a lot, your performance improves little, as expected, right? But if you're accessing memory a lot, your performance improves by more than 6%, which is not bad, actually, for a simple optimization uh, like this. Usually, it turns out it's difficult to optimize performance significantly unless you change to a very different processing model, as we will discuss uh, later on. But this is actually quite good. Uh, and across all 35 workloads, you don't see 35 here. These are just representative. Uh, it's about 5%. By the way, this is actually a very random access workload. It's called GUPS. It's used for developing HPC systems, for example. It's, all, all it does is randomly accessing memory, for example. And that improves a lot, as you can see over here, almost 20%. And this is actually, I don't remember which DIM it is, so I don't remember the reductions that, uh, the memory latency reduction that was used. It, might, it must be in the paper. So, on a, basically, it improves performance, but on a multi-core system where you're actually stressing memory, where you're running, let's say, four copies of these different workloads, the performance improvements are even higher because you, there you have a lot of interference. Whenever you reduce uh, uh, latency, you reduce interference. So, so latency reduction is always a good thing whenever you have interference. As you can see, uh, for memory-intensive multi-core workloads, the performance improves by 14%. And that's the average, whatever average means, right? <laughs> average doesn't mean anything uh, if the per performance uh, of a workload you care is 0%, right? So you, you got to be careful with performance evaluation all the time. It's average just to show that, oh, this is a good mechanism on average. But if you really care about your performance, for example, this MCF is a pointer chasing workload that does a lot of linked list pointer chasing. It actually does vehicle scheduling for a bus, bus depot. Uh, well... <laughs> You may be doing that, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Does that make sense? So this is one case, actually, where you could potentially evaluate the performance of an idea uh, on a real system, right? It doesn't happen very often, but in this case, we were able to. It wasn't, it's not the full idea, but the fact that you could keep the temperature low without doing anything <laughs> enabled the evaluation of the idea, right? That doesn't happen very often. So if you look at the paper, the paper also has simulation results for other evaluations. What if you change the other things in the system? Right. Okay. Any questions? Sounds like fun, right? Okay. So what about energy? Uh, reducing latency actually reduces energy also because you keep things active for a shorter period of time. And uh, this is also, of course, harder to evaluate. Uh, uh, but uh, if you uh, look at the paper, you can see that uh, it reduces power consumption by 5.8%, 5, 5 which is, again, not bad. Uh, did I make the joke about reducing power consumption in this class before? So there was a time when people were writing papers uh, where uh, they were reporting power, power reduction uh, results on the order of 40% on a processor. And at the same time, Intel was... Uh, going around and trying to educate people, saying no part of our processor actually consumes more power than 5% of the entire chip. 
And people were writing papers. Oh, if I change just this part of the chip, you can actually reduce, p p p p p p reduce power by about 40%. <laughs> but there's this discrepancy. Uh, usually, if you have a really good design, things are balanced, and it's difficult to just change one thing and get 40% performance improvement. That's or 40% power reduction. Uh, now, I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's very difficult if you have a good optimized balanced design, right? But by definition, that's not that balanced design if you could change one thing. <laughs> but if, you actually, if, if that's actually really true, that's a really good mechanism. <laughs> so it's always good to strive for such things, but maybe power is not the easiest <laughs> thing to change in the system, uh, to reduce in the system by that little tweak. Okay. So like everything else, this idea, however simple it may sound, even this has advanced and disadvantages, and it's always good to consider advanced and disadvantages of any idea in this course or anywhere, right? So advantages, I'll give you, it's very simple, right? It's a simple mechanism to reduce latency, and you can see significant per system performance and energy benefits. It's not 10x, but 10x is hard. Uh, and benefits are higher at low temperature also and low cost and low complexity, so you don't need much changes. But the downside is somebody needs to do determine these reliable operation latencies for different temperatures and different dims, right? At least a higher testing cost. Now, it may not be that difficult for low temperatures, so it's not as bad, in my opinion, uh, to do this testing. Uh, and even, actually, if you look at the paper, there is even, uh, there's, there's a margin that we assume even at low temperatures. So that margin is also added, just for reliability purposes. Even then, you can reduce the latency significantly. So you have to have some margin because there's some uncertainty that uh, you want to guarantee, right? Uh, but this is the downside. Any other downsides you can see? No, exercise, the critical thinking. Upsides, that's also fine. No? Okay, good. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, it can be, uh, well, uh, actually, you can do the measurements if you want <laughs> on your laptop uh, and see <laughs> what the temperature is. I'm not convinced that it's going to be higher than 55 degrees Celsius. It could be at times. Uh, but uh, as long as you can adapt, that's fine, right? Maybe you, some of the time you don't get the benefit, but some of the time you get the benefit. Yeah. So that's true, basically. How, how do you actually think when, when things are really packed together and there's a lot more heat that you cannot easily take away, uh, it, it becomes more difficult to exploit the sort of uh, temperature margin. So you're absolutely right in that sense. Yes? So 35C is ambient, right? Ambient temperature? Or? Okay, yeah, there you go. So this is actually 55 degrees Celsius, all of the results. Yeah. So if you go lower, you, you will get even more latency benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's, that's an empirical question. <laughs> no, it, it's, I, don't, I don't think it's linear, no. I don't think you can say that. But that's a, that's a good example of uh, where this can be employed potentially, right? because you want to operate things at low temperature over there. And you have control over the temperature as opposed to maybe on this one. Okay, so this is just to give you an idea uh, of one of the latency reductions. So there's a lot of margin, but let's take a look at other things. Uh, so there are different types of latency variation, as I said, uh, adaptive latency, DRAM exploits latency variation across time, which is different temperatures and across chips. But is there also latency variation within a chip? And your answer should be yes by looking at my picture earlier across different parts of a chip. That was not exploited in what I described, right? And this is more complex, of course. Let's take a look at that. Uh, I'll give you some results, basically. Again, this is the uh, sensing latency or activation latency, TRCD. The standard with some standard is 13.1 nanoseconds. Uh, let's look at the bit error rates across 240 DRAM chips for 7,500 7, rounds of experiments because you need to test uh, a lot. So when do you see errors? So there are no errors until here, <laughs> until you reduce the latency to 7.5. So there's a, a significant amount of margin, as you can see over here. Then you get some errors. 
So this is uh, different chips. This is, even, this is not even uh, within a chip yet, but this is across chips. You see the wide variation across the chips, right? When you reduce it to 7.5 nanoseconds, which is a little bit, uh, maybe 40% reduction. Uh, there are a bunch of chips over here that see some errors, but it's not a lot, as you can see. Lower is better here. But there are a bunch of chips over here that see a lot of errors. Bit error rate is 10 to the minus 1, which means that 1 out of 10 bits get errors. And if, if you keep reducing more, then all of the chips, almost all of the chips become non-operational. But there are even some chips over here that uh, do not see errors, but not a lot. <laughs> so this shows you the margin in a different way, right? Okay. Oh, I think I should have used those when I was explaining this, but that's okay. <laughs> you can see that this part, as you reduce it to 2.5 nanoseconds, you're basically uh, reading data that's garbage because you didn't even sense it yet. Uh, in the row buffers. So you're reading some garbage from somewhere in the air. Okay, so let's look at the within a chip. Uh, so within a chip, there is significant variation also. Uh, and it turns out some columns over here, as you can see, this is uh, the row number. This is the cache time number. You can think of this as a two-dimensional view of the chip. Right? And this is one dim that's operating at 7.5 nanoseconds. So there are always errors at 7.5 nanoseconds. But it turns out those errors are concentrated in certain columns. Well, why? Maybe the bit line is weak over there, right? Again, we don't know the reason. But because of the theory that I showed you earlier, something is weak over there. They're weak. And it turns out they're con concentrated, which means that you can potentially exploit that information if you expose it to the memory controller, right? So the observation is DRAM timing errors are concentrated on certain regions. And the idea is simple after that, right? Basically, you can reduce latency software transparently, or you could export to the software too, but let's uh, not go into there yet. You can divide the memory into regions of different latencies, and memory control uses lower latency for regions with slow cells, higher latency for regions, for other regions, let's say. You can, assuming you have, again, two parameters, slow, uh, slow latency, uh, low latency regions and high latency regions required for reliable operation. You can, of course, increase, uh, uh, make this finer grain and have many, many latency parameters, right? Similarly for ALDRAM, you could have one latency parameter, uh, one, one, one set of latency parameters at 10 degrees Celsius, another at 20, another at 30, dot, 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 but that increases your testing cost now. So two is easier, and two may buy you a lot of benefit. So let's take a look at that. Basically, uh, this is uh, the fraction of cells for TRCD sensing and TRP. Uh, a fraction of cells uh, that require operation at 13 nanoseconds, 10 nanoseconds, 7.5 nanosecond, 7 nanoseconds for TRCD activation over here. And this is the pre-charge. Okay, so this is what we see for real, three real DIMMs. Baseline doesn't distinguish between different cells. For this DIMM from one manufacturer, some representative DIMM, it turns out... Uh, some cells, maybe 10% of them, you can operate at 7.5 nanoseconds, 12%. Uh, but the remaining parts, you can operate at 10 nanoseconds. You don't need to go to 13 nanoseconds, right? That's the temperature margin or some margin. So for some other DIM from some other manufacturer, even more, you can operate at lower nanoseconds. And for this DIM, you can operate 99% of the cells at 7.5 nanoseconds. So if you have this information, and if you expose it to the memory controller, there's an upper bound, of course, everything operating at 7.5 nanoseconds, right? Uh, if you completely are able to lower the latency, but that's not realistic. But it's always good to compare your results to an ideal upper bound. Uh, we did that when, the re when we talked about reinforcement learning memory controllers. That actually gives you an idea of how much headroom you're missing, uh, either in the current system or in the idea. Okay. So basically, this is the performance. For, again, uh, this is simulation, of course. This is very hard to do in a real system. So the question is, can you evaluate this? What's happening here? OK. <laughs> can you evaluate this on a real system? Well, you can get the real latencies from an infrastructure that, uh, like what I showed you, FPGA-based infrastructure. But can you actually uh, access the different regions of a DRAM chip with different latencies? Unfortunately not. No memory controller I know of allows you to do that today. Uh, so basically, this. Uh, D1 DIM, which had only 12% uh, cells that, are, that can be accessed uh, at 7.5 nanosecond latency, even that you can improve performance by about 13% if you use that DIM uh, for 40 workloads compared to today. The other DIMs, they actually, you can actually improve performance even more 
and the upper bound is 19.7% according to simulation. So you can actually achieve upper bound uh, almost with this uh, particular uh, dim. Why? Because 99% of the cells over there can be reliably accessed with the really low latency, 7.5 nanoseconds. Makes sense, right? Okay. Okay. Of course, uh, like every idea, this again has advantages and disadvantages. Advantage is clear, hopefully, reduces latency significantly on average, again, uh, by exploiting significant within chip latency variation, which is shown with experimental results. Well, this advantage is similar. Now it's even harder, right? You need to determine reliable operating latencies for different parts of a chip. So your testing cost is higher. In fact, the testing infrastructure may be even more difficult here. Uh, and also you have more complicated controller, right? Before, your con control is also slightly more complicated, but this is even more complicated. I don't think this is that big of an issue, but uh, still it adds some complexity. Basically, you need to, for, for different regions, you need to have different timing parameters. Well, actually, it's, it may be more than slightly, <laughs> depending on how you design it, right? It's good, it's good for you to think about how you design it, because the different regions depend on the chip also, right? So you need to have a mechanism in the memory controller to actually identify what latency parameters you're going to use for what rows. One way would be building a table. Another way would be building bloom filters, for example, right? You can, you can have two different bins, or one bin, and then you can, whenever, whenever you get a row address, you can check whether it's in the low latency bin or high latency bin, right? That might be a much simpler way of implementing it. Right? Okay, so you should always think about the bag of tricks that you, <laughs> you've learned in this course. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, we're gonna go more complicated. <laughs> Because things are actually very, very complicated today. Well, it's very simple. Fundamentals are very simple. But when you look at, when you're really trying to understand the system, if you don't know the fundamentals, everything looks complicated. OK, these are not required papers, but you can take a look at them. And again, you can review any paper. So then the question comes. Uh, I didn't tell you why is there a special variation uh, on a chip. Well, one of the reasons I told you, manufacturing variation, right? Uh, but there's another reason, actually, uh, which is, uh, really architectural, or the way we design these chips, there is variation inherently in the chips. Even if everything was perfect, every cell was equal, you would still have latency variation. And the reason is actually hidden in this picture. <laughs> Basically, you have, uh, this is a subarray, let's say. You have these word line drivers. Whenever you activate uh, a word line, you need to drive that word line. And you have these sense amplifiers. Whenever you activate again, the bit lines drive, and then sense amplifiers later drive the bit line, right? Just because of that, because some cells are closer to these sensing structures and some cells are farther away, it takes time to access them differently. So, for example, if you're far away from the sense amplifier, there is propagation delay, right, in the interconnect. As a result, you're slower over here inherently and you're faster over here inherently which makes sense. Again, over here, distance from the word line driver, if you're closer to the word line driver, this column over here, you can access them faster or activate them faster because it's only this much distance in the word line. But if you're over here in this column, you're, you're slower. So clearly, because of this, you have an inherently fast region and an inherently slow region in the chip. And I don't know how to fix this, but... <laughs> That's how it is. Uh, so there's systematic variation. So the uh, variation doesn't come only from process variation, which is more or less random, actually. Studies have shown that, unless your process has a systematic variation in it. Uh, but it also comes from the systematic variation because of physical organization, architecture, and design. Uh, which means that, mm, now if I knew this inherently slow region, maybe I somehow can figure out the latency of my chip, right? <laughs> Maybe the DRI manufacturer doesn't need to tell me that latency. Now, you, you gotta stretch your mind a little bit, of course, right? If somebody told you this inherently slow region, maybe while the system is running, you test the inherently slow region and figure out the lowest latency you can reliably access that region with. And once you figure that out, you can say, oh, I'm gonna access everything else fast uh, at, at that latency. Does that make sense? 
That's the idea, basically. That's, so that's one of the ideas uh, in this paper. Inherently slow regions, somebody provides you that, and you profile these slow regions to determine the minimum latency. The DRM manufacturer can do this also, right? If they actually know what this region is because they know exactly how they designed the thing. Now, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm assuming there's no process variation at the moment. <laughs> everything is clean, everything is equal, right? So if you do that, you can basically dynamically figure out uh, the latency at low cost because this region is hopefully small. But of course, life is not that nice. <laughs> Never, because of process variation, you have some inherently slow cells that are not necessarily in this region. They may also be in that region. And as a result, you need to take care of that. What I just described doesn't work because you would get errors in these cells if you reduce the latency uh, based on the latency you found uh, for this inherently slow region that you can reliably operate that region at. So how do you fix the problem? Well, as an architect, and you should have some bag of tricks. Well, you should think about the errors, first of all. Clearly, this is design induced variation, so there's some localized errors that you get if you reduce latency too much. This is process variation. It's, it turns out, again, it's random. The, uh, the locations of these cells are random because, it's again, process variation is random. Again, it turns out. But you have to verify this with studies, of course, right? So whenever you have random errors, <laughs> error correcting codes are a very good way of correcting things, actually, because you don't know where the error will happen. And hopefully, because, of it's, because it's random, it's not going to be the entire row. Actually, if it's the entire row, uh, usually DRAM manufacturers can quickly figure out those errors, and they remap the rows to some other rows, for example. Internally, there's actually, I didn't talk about fault tolerance, actually. We should really try to. Uh, have, a, have a lecture on fault tolerance in this class maybe, or maybe we'll, we'll have a dependable systems class at some point you may want to take. Uh, but basically, the, internally, there's a lot of remapping of rows, remapping of, for example, if this column has a lot of errors and the, the manufacturer figures that out at the manufacturing time, this column gets remapped to some other column. There are some spare columns that are here that I don't show that are exactly part of this, but this column gets remapped, or this row that has a lot of errors gets remapped to some other row. But internally, there's actually more, more memory than you can use <laughs> externally. Okay, but let's, uh, let's take a step back. Basically, these errors are random. So if you have an error correcting code that's correcting, let's say, one bit per row. I'm just making it up right now, one bit per row. Well, you could correct this error, even though you found a, uh, a latency, uh, a lower latency uh, when you operate uh, this a cell at that lower latency, you would get an error, right? And you could correct that error. So random, uh, whenever you have this sort of errors, it's, nice to, it's easy to correct them with error correcting codes. But this one, you can f figure out the latency, reliable latency to operate this region uh, with online profiling. Okay. So basically, the idea in the end combines error correcting codes and online profiling. You figure out the lowest latency at which you can operate these region at, and you correct the resulting errors with ECC. Make sense? I'm not going to go into the theory of error correcting codes, but that's a different thing. Okay, but there's of course more, and you should read the paper for detail. So what is the benefit of this when you actually uh, mm, do the experiments on real chips again? So this is adaptive latency DRAM. These are different chips, newer chips, so the results are a bit different. But as you can see, at high, high temperatures, your latency reduction is lower. And at low temperatures, you get this latency reduction for reads. So if you do this sort of profiling that I said, relying on error correcting codes to correct random errors, uh, and also figuring out this inherently fast region, it turns out you can actually reduce latency at all temperatures. Because at this, level, uh, at this point, you still have this inherently slow region, and you're correcting the errors that you get because of high temperature variation uh, uh, with ECC. And there's some more in the paper that you can look at if you're interested. And the right latencies are also reduced significantly over here. Make sense? It's a little bit of a harder con concept, of course. Yes? Um, what's the hardware cost for implementing the ECC? Hmm. That's a good question. That's always a good question. <laughs> Depends on what kind of ECC you want. Uh, if, you, if it's a single error correcting uh, code, double error detecting code, there's some storage cost, of course, right? Usually it's uh, in, in modern chips, it's about 12.5%. But if you want to be stronger in your ECC, it's higher. And you need additional complexity, right, to correct the errors. You need logic 
So it really depends on the error correcting code. So you've pointed out one of the disadvantages. <laughs> you need to have error correcting codes. Yes? Uh, yeah, it depends, basically. It depends on which cells are faster. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, there, there, there are two things you can argue. Uh, if you actually fill them a lot, yes, they might be slower, but maybe you don't need to fill them a lot because they store a lot of charge. <laughs> so you're actually talking about the large cells. But in the end, uh, we really don't know because we don't know the internals. It's really based on testing. It's some cells that you can write faster to. They may be large, they may be slow, uh, they may be small, but they're de definitely faster to write to. <laughs> That's a very good point, though. <laughs> okay, so like every idea, I advance and discern, I put plus plus over here because <laughs> it automatically finds out the lowest reliable operating latency at system runtime, right? If you make this work. But of course, making it work is harder just because of that. The upside of this is production time testing cost is much lower. Now, nobody needs to figure out what's the lowest latency you can operate the chip at, right? And, of course, reduces latency more than prior methods, but it relies on ECC. So ECC is a key thing. This doesn't work without ECC. If you make it work without ECC, then talk to me. <laughs> but it's difficult. And it reduces latency at high temperatures as well, again, because it relies on ECC. Uh, and also the uh, variation uh, uh, due to physical organization. But disadvantages, well, require this knowledge of inherently slow regions. Somebody needs to provide that. It could be the DRM manufacturer. Right, again, in the SPD, for example, serial presence detect chip over there, you, they can provide for these chips, these are the inherently slow regions, and that needs to be recorded in the memory controller, and you need to profile it at runtime, and that is extra complexity, clearly. And the other thing is requiring error correcting codes, of course. And also, it imposes performance overhead during runtime profiling, right? Some, some, sometime you need to figure out, you need to actually profile this region to figure out the latency if you want to lower the latency. But hopefully that inherently slow region is small as a result that uh, runtime profiling is not so heavy in terms of uh, how long it takes. Okay, any questions? So hopefully I gave you a good overview of what you can do with latency. And similar trade-offs exist in other uh, chips as well. Okay, so if you're interested, you can look uh, more into this. Okay, this is probably a good time to take a break since my watch tells me that it's... 13.09. Let's take a seven-minute break, as usual, <laughs> and then we'll continue. All right, let's continue. So now we're going to look at some other lever, which is voltage. Uh, so far, we've been looking at latency-reliability relationship, right? When you reduce latency, you start getting errors, so you reduce latency to the point where you, you're, you're low latency, but you don't get errors or correct some of the errors with ECC. But if you put voltage into the picture, now you have actually a, a bigger trade-off space. Uh, and why is voltage important? Well, the motivation, one of the motivations for voltage is high power consumption, right? And I've given you actually this data, not this pictorially before, but when we talked about the main memory, we talked about memory consuming more than 40% power, and these are the pa some papers that you can look at uh, that talks about this. This is IBM Power 7. This is in a modern GPU. They characterize and figure out that more than 40% of the power is spent on DRAM. That's a lot. So there's low voltage memory. There are some existing DRAM designs that actually usually DRAM designs try to lower voltage by lowering the supply voltage, but they do it conservatively. And uh, basically this is the uh, power you sp uh, power is uh, correlated with uh, quadra quadratically with voltage. If you think about the power equation, it's C V square F, right? You might have learned it somewhere. It's C is the capacitance, uh, and V square is voltage, and F is the frequency. Uh, and there's also an activity factor also that I ignore over here, how much you're active. Uh, and V is voltage uh, square part is over here. And this is actually well known, very well known. So processors do dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, for example. Uh, to reduce power. Actually, when, they, when you reduce uh, voltage, you can also reduce frequency or vice versa. As a result, if you reduce voltage by some amount, you get a cubic reduction in power. Uh, 
because you can reduce both voltage and frequency, and by CV square F, you can reduce the power uh, in a cubic manner. Uh, so volta reducing voltage has a big impact on power. So for example, DDR3, low voltage DDR3, uh, reduces voltage from 1.5 volts to 1.35 volts, 10%, which is not bad. You can, you can uh, do square of it. And LPDDR4 employs low power I.O. interface with uh, smaller volts, basically. But that leads to lower bandwidth as well. The key question is, can we actually somehow do more? Because of variation, again, is there a variation in voltage, reliable operating voltage across different things? Or is there something? Can we understand the voltage better? Basically, the, the, there are two key goals. We would like to understand and characterize the various characteristics of DRAM under reduced voltage. And once you figure out something, you develop a mechanism to reduce DRAM energy, for example, as an example, by lowering voltage while keeping performance loss within a target. Make sense? But this doesn't have to be the only mechanism. If you understand how DRAM operates at low voltage or at high voltage, and what late, what, how that affects latency and reliability, perhaps you can increase the voltage so that you get lower latency, right? But we'll, we'll see that in a little bit. So there's a couple of questions. How does reducing voltage affect reliability? And how does reducing voltage affect latency, affect reliable DRAM latency? And we'll see that, uh, that effect. Uh, how, how do we design new DRAM energy reduction mechanism? So this is an example. So this is what uh, happens in current DRAM. Supply voltage goes to every chip on the same module. And this is the infrastructure that we've discussed earlier. You can actually adjust the supply voltage to DRAM modules, and that enables you to characterize the modules. OK, so let's, let's take a look at some results very quickly again. Uh, these are some DDR3 low voltage uh, dims. And I'm going to show you some results by this, with this experiment. You iteratively read every bit in each chip under a wide range of supply voltage levels, 1.35 volts to 1.0 volts. That's a 26% difference. OK, let's see the variation first of all. This is uh, the supply voltage. That's the nominal voltage for these chips. And these are different vendors. And this is a fraction of cache blocks that you read with errors. For this vendor, well, I guess I show all the vendors at the same time. For this vendor, errors start appealing, appearing very quickly. Right? For this vendor over here, or for these two vendors, you can actually reduce the voltage significantly right? uh, to 1.15 volts without getting any errors. So there's significant voltage margin, as you can see. And these error bars are actually the distribution of the chips uh, uh, where they fall uh, in here. So this is, there is some minimum voltage uh, without errors, as you can see. We min, let's, say, let's call that. And there are clearly some errors induced by reduced voltage operation, because things become slow, and you're basically reading them at the same timing parameters. As a result, you're getting errors, right? You're not changing the timing parameters, but you're changing the voltage. But as a result, things are becoming slower. Like the, all of the operations that we've discussed are becoming slower. So clearly, reducing voltage below Vmin causes an increasing number of errors. You don't want to be in this range. As you can see, it's actually a lot of errors over here. OK. Uh, so uh, if you actually go and do the circuit simulations, which you can actually download the code and do it yourself if you're interested, this is uh, the relationship between supply voltage and the reliable operation latency. So as you reduce the voltage, you should really increase your latencies because things are slower, because the timing parameters, such that you can read everything reliably. And that's the curve that looks like this. And this is for the activation latency, and that's for the pre-charge latency. And you can actually draw the curves for all of the other timing parameters as well. That's what the theory or simulation uh, suggests in circuits. Let's take a look at how this curve looks like in real chips. So this is another. Uh, one of the other reasons why I'm describing some of these is, is to show you the evaluation methodologies, right? This is a very circuit-level simulation uh, that you have, but you're not sure if this is the case in real life. So how do you look at it? Basically, you go and test the chips under these conditions, and I figure out the reliable operation latency and see if those curves look similar. And it looks like the curve is similar, right? Maybe it's not as perfect as that one. But basically, uh, this is for one manufacturer, I think, Again, this is supply voltage, and this is the measured minimum activation latency, reliable activation latency. And the, uh, the, uh, how large uh, this circle is indicates the fraction of chips that operate correctly at that latency. So one, all, the entire, uh, all of the chips, 
operate correctly until the supply voltage becomes lower than whatever this is, 1.125, right, or this vendor. And then if you operate things at 1.10 volts, it turns out 90% of the chips operate correctly at uh, an activation latency of 10 nanoseconds, but you need to increase the latency a little bit for 10% of the chips because they're slower. Again, you see the chip-to-chip -chip variation over here. If you reduce a little bit more, 1.075, 50% of the chips operate correctly uh, at the uh, activation latency of 10 nanoseconds. Now 40% require a higher latency and 10% do not operate at all. <laughs> so they have catastrophic failures because of the voltage reduction. And as you see, the, the curve climbs in, cl starts climbing up over here. And at this point, if you reduce the supply voltage to almost, this is 1.025, only 10% of the chips operate correctly at 12.5 uh, nanoseconds. Make sense? So clearly you can replicate uh, this curve somewhat, maybe not perfectly, but close enough. Uh, in real, these are real devices. Um, so I, I also have this, uh, and whenever you're doing real device measurements, there's always a margin of error. In this case, the margin of error is 2.5 nanoseconds over here. That's the granularity at which we can change the latencies, timing, latencies of the timing parameters. That's why uh, things actually can operate in this region uh, over here, that blue region. So we cannot test at a finer granularity than this. Okay, well, that's the annotation. So 40% of the modules, you can still operate correctly at very, very low voltage if you increase the latency to 12.5 nanoseconds. It's not bad. And I've already given you that. Okay. Okay, and that's the curve. So basically, that's the understanding. DRAM requires longer latency to access data without errors at lower voltage. Now, this is interesting because you could use the trade-off in both ways, right? You could reduce energy by reducing voltage and increase latencies to ensure that you can reduce voltage really aggressively, or you could go the other way, right? <laughs> Perhaps you could increase voltage and reduce uh, the latencies. So it'd be interesting to see that part of the curve, actually. <laughs> okay, so the other observation is, uh, so this shows you both uh, across chip variation, right? But there's also within chip variation, you can see spatial locality of errors. When you reduce the voltage by 12% for this particular chip, you see that, you see a very clear pattern, right? These are different banks, and these are different rows in the bank, and some banks don't see any errors. Some banks see a lot of errors, but even within the bank, there are some rows, particular rows that see errors. So clearly because of some variation, again, a combination of both uh, process variation and uh, architectural variation, you see this effect. Make sense? So. You, Again, to, to truly understand why this is happening, you need to understand the chip itself. But errors concentrate in certain regions. And if you actually figure out uh, what regions uh, can be operated at low voltage, you could operate at them at low voltage without getting any errors. So these banks, for example. Okay, so I already discussed all of this, I think. Voltage-induced errors increase as voltage reduces further below Vmin. Errors exhibit spatial locality. And increasing the latency of DRAM operations mitigates voltage-induced errors. Uh, I don't know why this is here. That's interesting. How about this? I deleted the slide. <laughs> okay, so how do you take advantage of this? Uh, basically, uh, you can exploit the trade-off, as I said, to reduce energy consumption. Let's take a look at reducing energy consumption right now. You could potentially do it for uh, reducing latency also. Uh, but I'm not sure if this is the best way of reducing latency. Increasing energy consumption for reducing latency, in my opinion, in general, not a good way. And in this case, you're, because the power has cubic relationship or a quadratic relationship with voltage, that's actually bad. Right? You want, if you want to reduce latency, you don't want to increase your voltage that much because that has a bad effect on your energy. Whereas the previous things that we've discussed, previous mechanisms that we've discussed, actually reduce latency without increasing energy, right? They actually reduce energy as well. Okay, so approach, how do you do this reliably? Uh, because you have performance loss, due, and also you have performance loss due to increased latency at lower voltage. So this is uh, the power savings you would get as you change the supply voltage. You can see the quadratic relationship here a little bit. Uh, so this is a performance uh, reduction 
and that's the power savings, DRAM power savings. <laughs> so here you save little, and you lose little. Here you save a lot, but you lose a lot <laughs> in terms of performance. So there's clear, clear trade-off. The key question is how do you achieve a good trade-off? Uh, okay. So the idea here, I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but this is one example of how you can take advantage of the lower level properties uh, of devices is, for example, user can specify a performance loss target and the system somehow selects the minimum DRM voltage without violating that target. And the goal is to minimize energy while satisfying that target. And a lot of systems behave that way. Sometimes you don't care about the performance you get unless it's lower than some bound, right? So how do we predict performance loss due to increased latency under low DRAM voltage? That's a key question if you want to do this. Uh, you need to have a mechanism to predict, uh, tie the voltage to the performance loss that you're getting. And the paper has a description. If you're interested, you can read it. But basically, you can build a linear regression model uh, based on some inputs, input maybe applications characteristics, and the DRAM voltage, and this regression model. You do some training. And you figure out, and you can do other techniques potentially also, but this is a static technique. For example, you build the model and then use it uh, online. Uh, and uh, this gives you a predicted performance loss, right, for a given DRAM voltage level. And based on that and comparing to the target, you figure out this is my voltage because uh, that doesn't violate my target based on the model I've built statically. That's the idea. So what should, uh, what should that model include? The paper gives you an idea about memory intensity, for example. It's important, right? If you're heavily accessing memory, and if you have to increase the latency, then you have a problem, potentially. And memory stall time also, how critical is latency uh, to your performance? And you need to somehow handle multiple applications, which we will talk about also. So that's, th these are always practical difficulties with building models like this, right? What if you have multiple applications? You need to predict performance loss for different applications, right? And you need to select the minimum voltage that satisfies the target for all applications. Okay, let's assume you've done this. Well, I guess before that, uh, let's, let's take a look at what people do. This is actually some of our prior work a long time ago. <laughs> but basically, uh, you can, the idea is very simple. CPUs dynamically scale frequency and voltage. Why don't you do that for memory also, right? And you can do this based on bandwidth demand. If an application doesn't require a lot of bandwidth, you can reduce the voltage and reduce the frequency. But it turns out in that work, what we did was you reduced the frequency uh, and the voltage of the off-chip channel, this I.O. bus over here. Now, the problem is if you reduce the frequency, uh, if, you, if you reduce the voltage of this off-chip channel, the interconnect between the memory and the, proce uh, and the processor, you need to re uh, you'd reduce the channel frequency because you need to have a higher voltage to sustain a higher frequency. As a result, you reduce the data throughput in memory. So that may not be a good idea. <laughs> so a better idea is to somehow modify this such that you keep this at high frequency, but you operate the DRAM array at the low voltage. Now, if you can do that, which requires some change, uh, then you can, you can sustain the same bandwidth over here, but you can save power over here. You may not be able to save power over there. <laughs> That's okay, maybe. <laughs> okay, so the other thing is, as we've discussed, there's spatial locality of errors, so you can actually exploit that spatial locality. Uh, you reduce, uh, whenever you reduce the voltage, you access only those banks with errors at high latency and the other banks at low latency, right? Again, this requires information to be communicated to the memory controller. So the benefit is now you get higher performance, of course, because you don't operate everything indiscriminately at high latency, you operate things that can operate at low latency at low latency. Make sense? Okay, so again, how do you evaluate it? Well, <laughs> this doesn't exist, and actually this requires a lot of changes compared to what we've discussed so far, so you definitely need to simulate this, and you've already seen RAM later. But to, there are also other tools that we didn't discuss, for example, how do you get the power consumption? Well, there, there are tools that, there are simulators that enable you to get power consumption. Now, you could always, question the accuracy of all of these tools. Performance is relatively easier to model, actually, compared to power, energy. But they exist. Okay, so, and then, it's always good to compare to a related work whenever you're proposing an idea, as you can see. Okay, so let's take a look, very quick look. Basically, this is across, average across a bunch of applications, again. And this is uh, CPU plus DRAM energy savings. So it's really the overall platform energy savings. Uh, and. It, of course, depends on your memory intensity. If your memory intensity is high, you save a lot more with the Voltron mechanism. 
Now, the downside of scaling the frequency uh, and voltage together of the DRAM interfaces, when you have high memory intensity, you don't want to do that because you have high bandwidth demand from DRAM. As a result, you don't gain much savings in energy because the, uh, because the mechanism, the VFS mechanism, the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling mechanism, says I'm not going to scale the voltage and frequency because everybody is demanding a lot of bandwidth. Right? Whereas in this case, you don't have that problem because you're not changing the bandwidth to main memory. As a result, you save a lot more when you actually need to save a lot more when you're accessing memory a lot. And low memory intensity applications are not that interesting in general, but even there you save because you reduce the voltage uh, to memory. Okay, you can read the paper if you're interested. But this is the performance target. So of course, I didn't tell you the performance target, right? This requires some performance target. The performance target to be evaluated was basically, you shouldn't lose performance by more than 5%. And the average performance loss is about this, basically. Less, much less than 5%. Uh, but of course, you should always ask, a performance target really should not look at average. It should look at really uh, the distribution, right? And that should have been on this graph, but it's not, but it's in the paper. So the distribution, I think, goes down to 3.6 or 3.8% or so. So you're still within the target. But there is no guarantee, of course. Usually, whenever you have performance targets, it's very, very difficult to guarantee them with empirical methods like this. If you really want to guarantee them, you need to do worst case analysis. And once you're doing worst case analysis, you're bound by the worst case. And you cannot do this sort of optimization in general. A lot of hard, hard real-time systems are that way, basically. They require really hard real-time guarantees. For example, automatic braking system in a car. You require a really hard real-time guarantee, because otherwise things can be disastrous. And as a result, they're designed with worst-case latencies in mind. So they actually calculate what is going to be the, my worst-case latency in this case, and the system is optimized to ensure that that worst-case latency is below some latency. And once you're optimizing for worst-case latency, it's you cannot optimize for average latency. Okay, makes sense, right? Cool. Okay, uh, well, <laughs> the usual slide about advantages and disadvantages. The advantage is now you have a different trade-off, right? So you can trade off between voltage and latency to improve energy or performance. We looked at energy in this case at the expense of performance. This is not one of those beautiful ideas where you improve both at the same time, right? Those are always better ideas. And you can exploit the high voltage margin present in DRAM. Uh, uh, the disadvantage is now you're, you need to find reliable operating voltage for each chip and maybe for each bank if you want to exploit that spatial locality, right? And that's actually increase your testing cost even more. This is actually much harder uh, than the other ones that we've discussed. But it's important to explore. That's how you improve the system, right? Uh, so nobody was doing memory dynamic voltage and frequency scaling in 2011, that paper, right? Uh, now people are doing frequency scaling, for sure. Voltage scaling, I believe, but they may be doing that also. I'm not sure. I shouldn't, I shouldn't speak too much, <laughs> but yeah, they're certainly uh, moving. And also, nobody was doing dynamic voltage and frequency scaling in processors 20 years ago, actually, right? Uh, but now everybody's doing dynamic voltage and frequency scaling in processors, right? So you do need these sort of techniques to uh, improve the system. Okay, so if you want more, you can read this 40-page paper. <laughs> I think in, the, in some format, it's 40 pages. I don't like those formats. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think this is all I have for latency almost, but I'll leave with this question uh, because this is something we have not even touched yet, right? Well, I touched a bit briefly when I talked about main memory and one of the ways of uh, taking advantage of and, and embracing the unreliability, right? Well, if you can sacrifice reliability of some data to access it with even lower latency, now you open up something even bigger, right? Of course, this is more difficult because now you need to ensure that you're, you mark your data appropriately, such that you don't do this for the wrong data, as we've discussed. But now you can, uh, now you can dream even more, right? <laughs> How do you actually do this? It's interesting. But this, this opens up even lower latencies. And I think going forward, we will see more and more of this. This is actually used commonly in systems. For example, uh, whenever people, do, people design multimedia systems for... Uh, Video delivery, for example, they adapt the quality of the video to the bandwidth you have on the network. It's essentially what's happening here, potentially, right? Maybe you don't care about that quality of the video and you have very little uh, resource in the system, latency, 
maybe, and then you adapt the quality of your data uh, to the latency uh, uh, or to the bandwidth that you have, right? So it's a system that let's use very, very heavily. If you, if you design a video delivery system, you'll know this very well, yes. Regarding the video system, we can probably use this thing in like embedded video cameras because they have like the raw material and there it's going through the encoder mm -hmm. and the encoder is gonna like compress the data. So if we have like a lot of errors, it's still gonna be pretty much unnoticeable after the encoder mm -hmm. phase. I mean, it could be used. I don't know if it's being used, but it sounds uh, like- You a, mean this, what yeah, I described yeah, over yeah. here? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. I think it could be used. I don't think it's used right now because it, people are not thinking this deeply at the moment. But I think, yeah, I agree. Those are places where you can e more easily adopt an idea like this because they already are ready, right? The infrastructure is already there at the software level uh, because you can adapt the compression, for example, right? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Maybe you can do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, al it's always good to think about the systems broadly. This, uh, whenever I think, uh, write, write this and talk about this, it, uh, it always reminds me, people are already doing this at some level in the system because they can. Today, we're not doing it because we cannot. <laughs> but as an architect, you always enable what you cannot today, right? Okay, well, this is my big picture now. <laughs> Basically, there's a big challenge going forward, I think. How do you make things uh, fundamentally low latency? And everything we discussed is low latency with the exception of voltage where we delved into energy uh, a little bit. But let's talk about even more fundamentally reducing uh, latency and energy at the same time. And that brings us to something called processing in memory, <laughs> which is a really old idea. People have looked at this since the 1960s. Actually, the earliest paper that looks at it from a von Neumann-like perspective uh, at least in that regime perspective is uh, in 1970 by uh, Harold Stone, uh, who was at IBM Research, and he talked about a logic in memory computer. So memory should have some logic in it. But maybe I'll give you the historical perspective later. So the observation is simple. High energy and high latency, well, high latency, let's start with latency, is caused by data movement. Right? That's what tiered latency DRAM was trying to optimize. Right? It basically said these bit lines are the dominant, and you're moving the data. So why don't we reduce the latency by making the bit lines shorter? So you reduce the data movement, really, by making the bit lines shorter, by, make, by making the interconnect shorter. And that's true for energy also. So basically, what is, uh, you have long energy-hungry interconnects, including the bit line. You have energy-hungry electrical interfaces. If you think about DRAM memory interface, you have to go through these huge I.O. pads to get out of the chip and get into the chip. And those are expensive in terms of both energy and latency. And there's a lot of asynchronous handshaking that adds to the latency over there. And you need to move large amounts of data, at least in most interesting applications that we have today, right? Once you're doing this, then you have a problem because you're causing the high latency and high energy. So the opportunity is maybe you can more fundamentally change things uh, by minimizing the data movement. And how do you do that? Well, don't move the data. <laughs> by do, do computation directly where the data resides or close to the, where the data resides if directly inside where the data resides is not that feasible or easy. That's the idea. And this is called processing in memory, PIM. People like renaming things so that <laughs> it feels like a little bit different. So you can think uh, in-memory computation is not bad, actually. But people call it near data processing these days, as if processing in memory is not good enough for some reason. But they're all the same thing, basically. Processing in memory doesn't mean that really inside memory. It's, it may be close to where the memory is, right? OK. So it's a general concept applicable to any data storage unit, actually. Uh, we're going to talk about it in the context of main memory and specifically in DRAM again. Uh, but again, you could do, imagine doing it in caches, right? Today, caches are also dumb slaves. I'll go back to the dumb slave analog analogy. But basically, they don't do anything. They just give the data to the processor so that the processor can process it. But you can imagine, if you have a large cache, maybe do some processing over there. Or SSD. SSDs are actually right now capable of potentially doing it because they have processors. In the, remember the SSD controller picture that I had? It had a processor inside there, actually. So there you actually have a much bigger opportunity, uh, potentially. You don't need to move data. But SSDs are dumb again because they don't do computation. They just use that processor for something else to manage the SSD, right? Uh, and also a main memory. And 
I don't know, you could extend this to tape for perhaps, right? <laughs> Maybe, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> okay, so the problem, let me give you the context a little bit. I think um, there's also an energy uh, story to it. And maybe actually uh, energy is perhaps even the bigger story because that's going to be the even bigger bottleneck. That's, uh, whatever energy you spend also limits your performance in your system today uh, and to scale forward. And also you can say um, it's also good to think about, uh, we're going to talk about some of these latency tolerance, prefetching, dot, dot, dot techniques. Uh, but uh, you can potentially think about tolerating latencies by designing a very complex system. That's what we do today, actually. We try to overlap latencies like memory level parallelism. We try to prefetch data. We try to do a lot of caching, complicate the system to minimize the effect of the latency on the system. So you could potentially think about reducing that effect. But all of those things that you do to minimize the effect of latency on performance come at the cost of high energy. <laughs> so energy is really the key thing that you can gain uh, with uh, minimizing data movement or processing in memory that you can really, really not gain in any other way, in my opinion. Yes? Uh, yeah. Do they actually like have the system or is it just some kind of a idea proposal? Because it, mm -hmm. should pro it will probably change the paradigm in how we write software if we actually have a coprocessor mm -hmm. which is in memory. It's like pretty much like GPUs today. If we want to delegate something to, to GPU, it's a completely different <laughs> programming model. That's and right. This would <laughs> also probably change it and maybe the compiler could do it, but then again, it's mm -hmm. not really easy. I mean, I, I know what, what's their idea. Is, is it like... Well, I'll give you, I'll give you the uh, story. But today, people are moving toward that direction, meaning there is no single system that does it. But people, are for, people have, for example, prototype, prototypes where they do this processing in SSDs. Uh, Samsung, for example, has papers that are written about this where they do processing inside the SSD. Uh, actually, there are a couple of other papers uh, uh, that I, I'd be happy to recommend to you where they actually show that you get a lot of benefit. But yes, it does change a lot of things in the paradigm, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those changes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so basically, uh, uh, yeah, the design principles that we have today cause great energy waste. So let me motivate it to you. Processing of data is performed away from the data, and this is actually historical, right? Uh, you can argue why historical that way, but let's say this is the classic von Neumann paper. I would recommend you to read if you want to read about the one Moyum model. But you could also read the chapters that I recommended before uh, from the Pat and Patel book. But you have three key components in a system, right? Computation, communication, and storage slash memory. These are actually the same. At some level, they diverge. We'll talk about that later on. Uh, but basically, this is what it looks like. And today, we have heavily optimized this, right? Uh, today's systems are overwhelmingly processor-centric. Uh, all data is processed in the processor at great system cost, as we, I've just discussed. Basically, everything moves over here. Let's say you just want to add two numbers <laughs> and store the data back. You move it all the way from the system, do the addition, and move it back all the way. Right? Does that make sense? Not clear if it makes sense. I don't think it makes sense. But it, it comes at great system cost because to be able to tolerate that huge data movement latency, today we add a lot more to this computing unit. We heavily optimize it and consider it the master. And as I said, data storage units are dumb and they're largely unoptimized, except for the things that are on the processor die. We talked about the caches, right, on the processor die. They're heavily optimized, actually, over here because they're precious, if you will. They're supplying data to the computation unit that's precious. Well, we've seen this, actually, right? I'm not going to harp on this, but yet <laughs> the processors are still stalling. <laughs> right? You have... Uh, this is real data, and there are a bunch of other things that talk, other, other works that talk about processors stalling for more than 50% of their time on interesting applications. Okay, so there are other perils of processor centric design. Uh, one is grossly imbalanced systems. Uh, we may talk about system balance. There's actually a beautiful paper by H.T. Kung, who actually designed the systolic arrays, uh, which is really the core of Google's TPU, uh, Tensor Processing Unit. But he basically uh, has something about system balance that talks about you got to balance I.O. and processing. Uh, but basically, today, we don't have, and balance design is a principle that we should follow all the time. But processing is only uh, done in one place. As a result, that causes a lot of imbalance. Uh, imbalance uh, results in a lot of data movement. And this is energy inefficient, low performance, and also complex. You have complex hierarchies to 
tolerate that, right? And as also results in overly complex and bloated processors as well as accelerators, right? For example, GPUs, they have a huge memory bottleneck and they were an accelerator and they're becoming overly complex and bloated as time goes by. Processors have already become overly complex and bloated uh, to tolerate data access from memory with out of order execution, for example, prefetching, caching, all of these sophisticated mechanisms. Uh, and you have complex hierarchies and mechanisms, and this is, again, energy inefficient. It leads to low performance if you think about it, because you could have invested that system cost somewhere else, potentially. Uh, and also, for, uh, for some access patterns, it's really low performance. If you're doing random access, for example, none of those techniques that were provided, except for memory level parallelism, <laughs> actually helps you. <laughs> memory level parallelism helps you by reducing the impact of a single random access uh, on performance, right? But caching doesn't help you. Prefetching doesn't help you by definition random access, unless you do really intelligent prefetching techniques, which we will talk about, but that comes at the cost of energy. Uh, okay. As a result, you get a lot of complexity because you need to tolerate the data access. And I've shown you this picture also. Most of the system is, in the end, dedicated to storing and moving data because of the way uh, we design these things, because computation is here. But of course, people were not stupid. There's a reason why computation is there, and uh, I'm, talk I'm going to talk about that when it's easy. Uh, okay, look, let's look at the system trends. Uh, I mean, this is obvious. Data access is a major bottleneck. Applications are increasingly data hungry. That's not going to change. Energy consumption is a key limiter, and data movement energy dominates compute. And I've shown you already this graph uh, from Bill Daly that shows basically that uh, a DRAM access is almost three orders of magnitude higher energy than a complex double precision floating point operation. Right? Again, does it make sense to do 3D RAM accesses to do one single addition? So I've I already said that, but uh, again, 70 years ago, the trend was the opposite. Basically, this was, more, this was red and this was green at that time. It wasn't DRAM, of course, at that time, but uh, it was some storage. Basically, this was more costly. Because, why? Because the logic was very, very expensive and slow at that time. And... As a result, you, it made sense a lot to optimize this. Uh, so there are other things that we can talk about. One Neumann model, for example, is good for sequential execution, right? So you can reason about it better. And that inherently may lead to processing inside a single place, which actually is true. But things are changing a lot today with accelerators, for example. People are actually very used to doing processing in accelerators. They're still processors, though. They're not somewhere close to memory. Okay, so basically, uh, this is what people are working on to enable a paradigm shift. Remember the paradigms we discussed a few lectures ago? To enable computation with minimal data movements and compute where it makes sense. Again, not necessarily in memory, in storage, in XXX, but where the data resides. Uh, and make computing architectures more data centric. So as you mentioned, this may be difficult because we may not even have the interfaces to do this at the moment, neither hardware and neither software, and we're going to talk about that. So what is the goal? So let's look at the specific case of in-memory. As I said, you could potentially do it in the cache, perhaps with less benefit. You could potentially do it in the SSD, perhaps with more benefit, depending on where your data resides again. You could potentially do it while the in uh, things are traveling through the routers. Again, depends. Uh, but let's look at the memory. So basically the idea is to store something important, your data, inside the memory. And one example could be the processor queries the data and send, sends a search request, like a query to the database, for example. And then the memory returns some results. And then maybe you keep doing this to get the data that you want. Uh, that's one way, right? Or you can partition the computation such that while the processor is doing something, uh, on some amount of data, memory is doing something else on some other amount of data. For example, if you have a database, if you have transactional and analytical queries, the transactional things are usually better fit over here, actually, because they're very sequential, whereas analytical queries go through a huge amount of data to find what you're looking for. Maybe that's better fit over here. So you could partition your computation that way, right? Or you could do everything over here or you could do some little things over here. Right? So it's a very open design space uh, at the moment. So there are many questions as a result. How do we design the compute-capable memory and the controllers? How do you design the processor chip after that? How do you design the software and hardware interfaces? If you think about it, there is no interface that enables you to do this today, neither in software nor in hardware. You cannot say, memory, please execute this. Now, you can come up with a programming language that does that, but hardware doesn't support that also. 
today. Now things are changing so that there might be support for it. Um, and system software and languages, they need to be involved again, right? Because now you have a scheduling decision where to execute what. And that's another processor perhaps for the system software. And maybe algorithms also. We'll discuss some things. Uh, today, think people are writing algorithms assuming that things are executed here. But if things are executed here in, in very different ways, maybe the algorithms need to change as well. So it's really something that can affect all the way from devices. I didn't even talk about the devices over here, but that's really hidden inside here. Maybe there are some devices that you can design such that they're much more capable of processing and memory at the same time. And all of this can change. Uh, and that will change the algorithms. Maybe the problem formulation into the algorithms also, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. <laughs> okay, so why is it interesting today? So as I said, this is not a new idea. Doing processing inside memory is not a new idea. It's old, actually. You see uh, all of these paper tigers that people have written, <laughs> where uh, paper tigers are tigers that never made it to real life, uh, which is good. That's good in research. It's not a problem, actually. But uh, uh, the, the question always comes, if people have examined it for 50 years, why are people examining it again today, right? Uh, well, when people examined it, uh, things were not the same. And it's always good to think about uh, the right time to do things. So today, actually, we have a huge push from technology. As I mentioned, as we've discussed, DRAM scaling is difficult. It's at jeopardy. And people are actually looking at controllers close to DRAM, and industry is open to new memory architectures. They're actually putting error correcting code inside their own memory. Whereas if you asked them to do it five years ago, they would have kicked you out of the room again. <laughs> right. So people are actually much more open because of this. Technology is not scaling as well. And actually, if I were a DRAM manufacturer, I'm glad I'm not. <laughs> I like what I do. Uh, but if I were a DRAM manufacturer, I would be looking at ways of adding value to my DRAM by putting more stuff in it and opening up new markets as opposed to this mindset of very, uh, very low cost thing that's not going to be valuable in 10 years time. Maybe they're making a lot of money today because there's a lot of demand, but there's a much bigger thing that you can do actually. But uh, anyway, this is happening very slowly, maybe much slowly than a researcher uh, would like to see. But again, this is an example for example, uh, uh, hybrid memory consortium is a consortium that basically looks at three D stacked memories you have a logic layer and memory layers, and we're going to talk about that, that are connected with high bandwidth through silicon vias over here. Uh, and this is another example. Those are through silicon vias. And there may be other technologies, of course. Basically, these are large wires that uh, connect across the chips over here. And that's high bandwidth and low latency. And people are, Micron actually has a chip where you can do processing in memory, and people actually have a uh, limited form. People have been exploring the software mechanisms for this to take advantage of it. You can see papers and conferences. Uh, this does some operations in the row buffer. Basically, you can do deterministic finite automaton computations inside the row buffer. Very, very limited, but you can do some things. People have manufactured this, actually. Uh, and this didn't exist a long time ago. So the other thing that's, that was not present in the past is the systems and application side. People uh, were not as constrained at the system and application level with data movement as we have today. Uh, today, data access is a major system and application bottleneck, and systems are very energy limited. Again, uh, rewind 20 years ago, actually, if you remember, if you're old enough, uh, even at that time, 20 years ago, it was 1997, power was less of a concern. Uh, actually, people were not thinking, everybody was thinking from the performance direction, power, energy, they were not as important. Rewind 30 years ago, people didn't even talk about power. <laughs> or a very, very limited set of folks. It was, like, it was a niche at that time. But today, power is performance, right? Energy is performance, because if you actually reduce energy, you can gain performance in some other ways, perhaps, because you can make the system more scalable. And data moments, uh, we've discussed this, basically, much more energy hunger than computation. Again, 70 years ago, that was not the case. It was the opposite. OK, so uh, given this, uh, it's, uh, the time is very ripe. And again, I'm putting this because it's important to know uh, as an architect, know uh, when to develop ideas based on this timing, right? But of course, there's another thing that I didn't talk about, which is the approach that people had to processing in memory. So one of the approaches was you take a DRAM chip and put a processor inside it. That approach is very, very difficult to do, regardless of whatever you have over here, because of technological reasons. Uh, I think that may be very interesting uh, at some level scientifically, but 
uh, if, at an implementation level, DRAM is really optimized for this capacitor. And that capacitor is very different from logic in the end. So if you want to have a high performance processor, you cannot put it in DRAM. If you put it in DRAM, it becomes very high leakage. Uh, and the processes are basically not compatible. So that approach is not uh, going to work, in my opinion, at least for a long time, un until we figure out how to make the processes compatible between DRAM and memory. Uh, although that approach may be more workable if you have memory that's uh, more compatible with logic. Potentially, magnetic random access memory is potentially more compatible than DRAM. So there it may work. I don't know yet. We'll see. We'll talk about the emerging technologies. So the approach needs to change also. And the second thing I think that people didn't really get to doing at that point in time was uh, how to make this adoptable. Right? How do you actually... Uh, so if you have some processor in memory, let's say, uh, assuming that, how do you make, uh, remove the barriers to adoption? Because as you mentioned, a lot of things need to change. And how do you ensure there's a starting point? So if your idea is here and the system is here, it's always good to start a little bit simple so that people can move toward that direction. If you just propose this without showing any way to adoption as an architect, then you have a problem. Your idea may always stay here and nobody can get to it. So it's always good to have little steps for adoption to enable that big thing. Maybe you don't gain as much in each step, but you gain something so that you can get closer to the bigger step. Right? So for example, if you can do some simple operations in memory as opposed to having a huge processor, that programming model may not be incompatible with what you have today, right? You can offload a simple, fun simple instruction, for example, which we will talk about. So that's another thing that, uh, that is different today. So people are thinking toward that direction. So let's, we'll talk about two approaches to in-memory processing. Uh, one is minimally changing DRAM to enable simple yet powerful computation primitives. This is surprisingly something that people didn't explore because they were always thinking about you actually put a huge processor inside DRAM. But there's actually a lot of computation capability inside uh, DRAM. And the second is the taking advantage of the opportunity of 3D stacking. Right? You have some logic layer where you can actually put anything. We'll talk about that anything later on. Uh, maybe not anything, but some things reasonably simple, but still better than what you can put on the memory chip. Uh, and you can exploit this to enable maybe more comprehensive computation near memory. And we'll talk about some works. These are actually not all of the works we'll talk about. These are a subset. OK, let's start with this. Uh, I'll give you the key idea very quickly, but then we'll take a break, because it's going, to be, it's going to take longer than what I intend to do. So the first approach is minimally changing DRAM. So DRAM, if you noticed, has great capability to perform bulk data movement and computation internally with very small changes. And actually, I've given you uh, one of the ideas. Remember, in tiered latency DRAM, you have inter-segment migration. We connect at the source. Whenever you want to move from the far segment to the near segment, you enable uh, the uh, word line in the far segment, which brings the data into the sense amplifier. And then you enable the word line in the near segment so that you can take the data from the sense amplifier to the near segment. That essentially enables you to copy one row to another. I'm going to talk about that idea from the processing in memory perspective. There it was used for caching. Right? But we'll talk more. So you can exploit the internal bandwidth to move data, and you can actually exploit analog computation capability. And there could be more. And we're going to talk about some of these. But I think this is probably a good place to stop and take a break. Otherwise, we're not, we're not going to be able to stop for a while. Let's take a seven-minute break. All right, let's, let's continue. I think I've given you a one-and-a-half-minute margin. So even we have margins. In the breaks. I hope pushing. I hope pushing the margins too low doesn't uh, cause errors in your brain or something. That's <laughs> that's it. That's the trade-off. <laughs> but hopefully this is exciting that you can follow. Okay. So remember, this is what we were going to do. We wanted to minimally change DRAM uh, to enable some things that we cannot do, that the processor does today. And if you want to start really simple, that adoption. Remember, you want to get to Things being, a lot of things being done in memory. If you change the system too much, you will never get there, maybe. But if you want to start simple, you really need to think simple and do the very simple things and make, thing, make the system a little bit closer to that a lot of change type of system. And whatever uh, the simplest thing that you can potentially think of doing is not even computation, and that's data copy initialization. 
and a specific form of data copy. Let's talk about bulk data copy. Basically, you copy a source page to a destination page, or you initialize a, a page to zero. Right? Today, even that's done uh, in the processor. And people have written a lot of papers where they talked about, oh, the copies are too slow, and that affects the operating system performance. And that's why things are not getting faster. <laughs> and we want hardware support for them in server platforms. And these folks actually added support to the memory controller, where the memory controller does the copying. But it still needs to go through the round trip of, the, uh, uh, of main memory. Basically, you need to go through the interconnect between the processor and memory. And these folks did more work, actually, <laughs> to optimize it. Uh, but bulk data copy and initialization is used in many, many places. I say bulk over here. You could actually do it at a small granularity, but let's talk about bulk for now. We'll talk about a small granularity later. But whenever you fork a process, for example, you need to copy some memory uh, to it. Whenever you initialize, for example, the, all of the operating systems that I know of initialize pages. In fact, uh, Windows used to have a zero page uh, area where they, they kept the zero pages. Because you don't want other people reading somebody else's pages after they're deallocated, right? Security is a good reason. Uh, checkpointing is another place where you copy pages when you clone a virtual machine. Uh, another place, you may need to migrate pages for some reason. That's where you actually do other pages. And uh, uh, that's where you do bulk data movement again. And there are many more cases like this. And there is a recent study. This is the paper that I mentioned that talked about memory latency being a bottleneck. They also measured uh, where do cycles get spent in Google's data center workloads. And they found out that just by these system calls, this is not even general data copy, just by calling these system calls, memmove and memcopy, they spend 5% of the cycles in the entire workload suite that they examined that they run at the Google's data center. So that's a lot, actually, just for these two functions. Uh, OK, let's see how we do bulk data copy today. Uh, today, basically, we have to go through the processor. If you want to copy this page to this page, let's say four kilobytes. Four kilobytes is small, actually. When, when I talk about four kilobytes, maybe you should think about one gigabytes. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, you need to copy the source page all the way to L1 byte by byte. And you need to write the, uh, bring the destination page byte by byte all the way into the L1, do the copy, and write back the destination back into memory. Now, this is high latency because you do three round trips over here uh, and a high bandwidth utilization and uh, because you actually need to move a lot of data through the bus. And this causes cache pollution over here because you actually need to move, pollute all the caches right over here. Of course, you could eliminate this if you actually do it through the memory controller by the direct memory access engine, right? Uh, you could actually program the direct memory access engine such that the copy is done without disturbing the cache hierarchy today. So you could eliminate this cache pollution over here. It comes at some cost, but that's fine. Uh, and you, you actually require a lot of unwanted data movement potentially because when you do the copy, maybe you don't need the destination page here, right? Maybe you're doing a lot of copying or a lot of initialization when you're initializing a huge database, for example. It makes no sense to bring it into the caches because you're not going to reuse those things that you're going to initialize until sometime later in the program after all of your caches are evicted. <laughs> right. So uh, this has a lot of uh, issues. Basically, uh, and when I talk about copy and initialization, I treat them the same. Because if you think about initialization, it's really a special case of copy. You're not copying a source page, but you're copying zeros into a destination page. Right. Uh, it's a little bit cheaper because you don't need to bring the source page. You know you're going to write zeros to it. Uh, okay, so basically, with some technology assumptions, if you want to do the four kilobyte page copy via the direct memory access engine without disturbing the hierarchy over here, it takes about 1,046 nanoseconds and 3.6 microjoules. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we had a system where we could tell the memory to do the copy internally and not bother anything else in the system? Right? That would be nice. This is low latency, and we're going to talk about methods, and you actually know the method, that intersegment migration method that we described is going to be the fastest method that you do it within a subarray. This is low bandwidth utilization because you're not moving anything on this interconnect, just a command probably to do the copy and some arguments. No cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today by doing it through the DMA engine. And no unwanted data moment. You move the destination data only when you really need it. Okay, 
So I'll show you a mechanism that in the best case reduces the 1,046 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds. You could actually optimize it to be 80 nanoseconds. And the 3.6 microjoules for the 4 kilobyte copy to 0 0.04 microjoules. That's almost two orders of magnitude. So the idea, as I said, you know already, it's not going to be that different. Uh, it's going to be, it's, it, it doesn't require tiered latency DRAM. That's the other, that's the benefit. So it's a bit simpler actually because you don't need to turn on the isolation transistor. But basically, let's assume that you have a four kilobyte row and the DRAM subarray. You know this structure really well by now. Uh, the first step is to activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer. And the next step after that is activate the destination row, which implicitly deactivates the source row and connects the sense amplifiers to the destination. And the sense amplifiers drive the data that they latched earlier into the destination. That's the simple idea. You can do a row to row copy really fast with just two consecutive activates. And there's a negligible hardware cost because almost all of the circuitry exists except current DRAMs don't allow you to do it because anyway, they don't allow you to do con two consecutive activates to the same subarray basically. <laughs> if they did, then you could have actually tested in a real DRAM chip. <laughs> but this is really, really negligible hardware cost. Make sense? Okay. So why does this work? I mean, you know this, but let's go through this really quickly. If your source and destination are in the same subarray, you know the basic DRAM operation. You activate the source, which perturbs the bit lines and sends amplifier amplifies the difference, and you get the data over here in the bit line, and then you do the restoration after that. And then after that is done, you disconnect this, but did not disable the sense amplifier. The sense amplifier is still enabled. And then you connect this. And once you connect that, sense amplifier is really strong, so it drives the data into the destination. It's based on shard sharing principles. Uh, OK, this is the architectural view. <laughs> OK, that's it. OK, so this looks nice, right? And as I said, this is nothing really different from the intersegment migration, except it doesn't require tiered latency DRAM. So the principles are the same. So OK, this is now limited, because as we discussed, subarrays are small. There's a reason why they're small, so your source and destination needs to be in the same subarray for this to work well. And there are a bunch of other issues also. For example, maybe what if this is not four kilobytes? Whether this is bigger, so you have an alignment issue. Your data needs to be aligned for this to work, which is fine. Maybe you can make that work. And that changes the paradigm now because you're now uh, somehow need to know the details of the internal architecture of DRAM. So there's uh, other mechanisms you could potentially add. This is another mechanism. If, if you look at the chip and the bank, as we've discussed earlier, there's an internal data bus. If your source data is here and the destination data is here, you can take advantage of that shared internal data bus. Let's see. Basically, let's say you want to copy not the entire row, but I don't know, 24 bytes, let's say. What you do is do this. Right. Internally, have, you already have the connections over here between the banks. There's nothing that much you, uh, much you need to add other than the orchestration of it. You need to set the uh, bank to the read mode, this bank to the write mode, and somehow be able to specify the data movement that way. So you need some extra commands for this to make it work. The previous one, you didn't really need extra commands. You just need different interpretation. But here, you do need uh, extra commands. So if you do this, it's actually still pretty fast. Uh, I will give you the exact numbers over here, but this is 2x latency reduction compared to moving all of the data to processor and 3.2x energy reduction. But the previous one is a lot more. So the generalized row clone, I just said, uh, you have intra subarray copy, very fast. You have interbank copy, pipeline read and write, one bank in read mode, the other bank in write mode, and the memory controller orchestrates this. Well, now we have a problem with the, within a bank. If you have, you have subarrays within a bank, if you remember, and they're not really connected in some way other than this shared bus over here. So the way we do this in this particular work is you basically, if you want to copy a row over here to a row over here, you first copy the row to another bank and from that bank to over here. That's the problem. Uh, you need to do this because there is no connection between the subarrays directly. Remember, this has its own row buffer, this has its own row buffer, and those row buffers are connected to the bank I.O. that sits outside. You could potentially add something to the bank I.O., but this is small, as you remember, because those global bit lines are large. So you have to go through it somewhere else and then bring it back. But that's also sl slow. So this is the slowest. But, of course, as an architect, you always think about how to make this possible. Well, if you somehow link 
the raw buffer of this subarray to this next subarray, well, maybe you can actually do that copy faster. So if you actually have isolation transistors between subarrays that can enable you to connect this subarray to that subarray, you can actually do that data movement fast also. I'm not going to talk about that. So basically, you can change things to make things more. But overall, all of this cost comes at very, very little area cost in the end. Let's look at uh, zeroing. Uh, this ugly picture shows you <laughs> a subarray. Uh, basically, you can fix one row at zero, for example, if zeroing is something that you do a lot. And then you can copy that to any other row. So if you're really initializing a lot of data, you can easily copy this row to all of the other rows in the subarray, I don't know, 512 times. And then that's much faster to do it internally than externally. But there might be other methods of initializing these. Uh, and you can talk to Louise about that. He's working on some of those. OK, so bulk initialization, that's the idea. Uh, zero initialization. So actually, if you want to initialize with arbitrary data, you initialize one row. For example, if you want to write uh, dead beef <laughs> in memory, <laughs> you basically write dead beef in one row and then copy that row to other rows. Right? That's obvious. Uh, so zero initialization most common. Perhaps you reserve a row in each subarray. Actually, zero is so common that uh, some architectures hardwire registers to zero. Uh, for example, alpha architecture. Now I don't remember. Is it R0 or R31? One of those is hardwired to zero, actually. Whenever you reference R0, it's zero. <laughs> so you could potentially do this also. Uh, and you copy data from the reserved row. So that gives you 6x lower latency and 41.x lower DM energy. And the loss in capacity, if you can tolerate that, that's good. So these are the uh, summary latency and energy benefits of the idea. It's called row clone. Uh, if, so of course, it's heterogeneous, as we've seen. If the source and destination pages, 4 kilobytes, are in the same subarray, you get almost 12x reduction in latency and 74x reduction in memory energy. Because you don't need to move the data in those large interconnects. You're actually limiting the data moment to the subarray. Now, if you keep going out, your benefits reduce. Interbank significantly reduces the latency benefit to almost 2x. And latency uh, energy benefits is still significant, but it's 3x. It's not as impressive as 74x. And inter subarray actually is you don't gain any latency. You could actually, you might as well do it in the memory controller if you're, uh, if you're concerned about latency, because you can pipeline things and the latency is still the same. Uh, but you still gain energy because you're not moving the data off the DRAM chip. So that's why energy is a much more significant gain than latency. Uh, and zeroing intra subarray makes sense for zeroing, and that's about 6x latency reduction and 40, 42x uh, uh, energy reduction in memory. Yes? Oh, this is compared to doing it through, uh, through the memory controller, just the memory controller, not, not even going to the caches uh, with a DDR3. Uh, interface, all the latency and bandwidth parameters, yes? Uh, they considered like uh, doing that with uh, two different channels. If we want to like initialize or copy data from one channel to another yeah. channel, it has to go to the controller. Yeah, so that's a difficult issue. So this, is, this only works if your data is within the same channel, right? Actually within the same chip. You cannot even go through the different ranks in the same channel. So if you're going through even different ranks in the same channel or different dims in the same channel or different channels, uh, then you have to do something else. You cannot take advantage of this. Yeah, yeah, this, I mean, even something simple like this requires changes uh, to the system to do the right data mapping if you want to take advantage of it, right? If you already mapped your data to two different channels, there's no way you're going to take advantage of this. You need to be uh, cognizant of the fact that you can do this data movement much faster in the same channel and map your source and destination to the same channel. In fact, same subarray, I would argue. <laughs> Uh, that's right. So it depends, basically, on what you're, what you're optimizing for. If you're doing a lot of copying, then <laughs> this makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So even something simple. So you're touching on all of the adoption issues for even something, like, something simple like this, right? Once you change the paradigm. So those channels are optimized for the CPU, right? 
But if you really are, are doing something like this, you really need to do, think about the channel and the system software not being optimized just for the CPU, but for something else as well. This issue exists in accelerators also. Right? Okay. So how do the applications benefit from it? You can read the paper for more detail, but actually there are a bunch of applications that do copying and reading, and these are not necessarily the best choice, perhaps, except for Forkbench. This is basically a fork program that does, fork, does a lot of forking. <laughs> and as a result, it does a lot of copies. So this is the fractional memory traffic that's caused, and it does a lot of copies. Some applications do, like when you boot up your system, you do a lot of initialization as well as copies. Uh, Memcached does some, whatever, that's zeroing, I guess, but it depends again. Uh, it really depends. Uh, and also, uh, it's always good to think about uh, uh, whether uh, applications are optimized, right? Usually people optimize their applications to minimize these bulk copies because they're expensive. Actually, if you go and uh, do some virtual machine work at VMware, you will see that they actually jump through a lot of hoops in software to ensure that they do minimal amount of copying of data from one place to another place. Across channels is a big no-no. <laughs> as much as possible, but even within a channel, they want to minimize that copying as much as possible. So, but then this makes the software really complex now. So that's always another uh, thing about evaluating future ideas with current applications. You have to modify the applications, and we didn't do that over here, uh, to actually take the best advantage of the technology. Again, as an architect, you need to think forward. Will people modify their applications? For example, today people are modifying their applications very heavily to take advantage of the GPUs, right? Maybe. 30 years ago, people may, have not, may not have considered that, right? but today they're doing that. They're rewriting their applications to take advantage of it. There is a path for adoption to take advantage of it. So if there's a path for adoption and the benefits are high, maybe people would do that also. Okay, anyway, so I don't want to harp on the results, but basically you do the simulations and you see performance benefits. Because, and the performance benefits are commensurate with the fraction of data movement that's caused by copy and initialization as expected, and this is a memory energy reduction. So you can, you can see significant memory energy reduction benefits. Okay, so we've already started talking about this, but even a simple idea like this requires some end-to-end -end system design. We're gonna to touch upon some issues because you're moving the computation, well, not even computation, the data copy, somewhere else than the CPU, right? First of all, your application needs to somehow communicate the occurrences of bulk copy and initialization across all these layers, right, all the way into the DRAM, all the way into the memory controller. How do you do that? Well, that requires some instructions. The nice thing is in x86 ISA, for example, you already have uh, an instruction that can do this bulk data copy. Let's repeat move S. You have a repeat prefix and you can move data and that enables you to do bulk data copy as large as your counter register can be. <laughs> so that interface exists in, the, in one of the ISAs at least. And that gets communicated and the processor does something. Actually, it's executed in microcode in the processor. The, the processor goes into a micro instruction loop where it goes through the register and does the copy itself. If you look at the specification of that instruction, it's a few pages. Uh, and if we were in a different class, I would let you implement it, but <laughs> we're, not <in> this <laughs> we're not going to do that here. So that exists, for example, at that interface, but it doesn't get communicated to the memory controller today. Well, maybe with Intel's hardware support with opaque verse, they, they do communicate it to the memory controller, but let's not talk about that. There are other issues. So how do you ensure cache coherence? So we didn't touch upon that. We're going to talk more about cache coherence, but the, basically the idea is when you're doing the, you want the memory to do the copy, but what if some of the cache blocks that belong to the source and destination pages are already cached in the caches? Well, if the destination page is cached, you're going to write to it, so you want to make sure that you don't have stale copy over here. If the source page is cached, maybe that's not a problem, but if the data is dirty in the caches and not dirty in the memory, then you first need to reflect that into the memory to the copy. And maybe if most of the pages are already cached, in the, most of the page, source page and destination page are already in the caches, it makes no sense to send it to memory. Right? So somehow you need to ensure that in general purpose systems at least. But if you're a special purpose, maybe the programmer handles that with a lot of going crazy. <laughs> okay, how do you maximize latency and energy savings? So th those issues that we discussed, basically things are faster if they're in the same subarray and somebody needs to map the data such that you could take advantage of this. Again, who does it? Operating system is a good choice over there perhaps. The operating system, if it's aware of the topology of DRAM, 
if it knows which channels, if it knows which banks, which subarrays, and how the data gets mapped over there, it can make much, much more intelligent decisions to take advantage of it. And those interfaces doesn't exist today again, and that's a barrier to adoption, for example. Now that, uh, as we discussed earlier, uh, when we talked about uh, memory controllers, operating system knowing that information is useful regardless, even if you're not doing computation in memory, because now the operating system can, for example, figure out which pages are conflicting and allocate them to different banks, right, through the virtual memory mapping mechanism. So that interface is actually something that's going to be huge going forward. How do you actually optimize to the operating system hardware interface. There's right now very little communication uh, the, between the two, but the operating system actually makes a lot of decisions that affect performance and energy at the lower levels. And people who are optimizing that are winning, in my opinion. People who have uh, control over the entire stack, perhaps, they can do a lot of optimization. Uh, okay. And how do you handle data use? So this is something, uh, again, if your source page and destination page are already, uh, for, for example, if your destination page is going to be reused very quickly, maybe it doesn't make sense to do this operation in memory. You bring the data quickly into the processor, right? This makes sense if you're not going to touch the destination page uh, for a long time. So you may need a dynamic decision mechanism to do this uh, depending on where your data resides and what your reuse patterns are. And this actually, all of this is true for any kind of in-memory computation. Even this, this is something really small, but everything that you do in memory uh, leads to these questions, basically. You'll need to somehow make sure these work. Okay, but then again, you can say, for example, I'm going to ignore this for now, and maybe really specialized programmers are going to take advantage of it. Maybe those people who can program really well. That may be a path to adoption also. Okay, so if you're interested, you can take a look at that paper. Um, I, I didn't assign this, but I'm going to assign something else. Okay, what we're looking at is really, if you look at the system design overall, uh, today we have a lot of accelerators. Again, that didn't used to be the case 15 years ago or so. Everything used to be just a single CPU. <laughs> now we have many CPUs, different CPUs, different cores, GPUs, uh, dot, dot, dot. Uh, and what I'm describing is just thinking of memory as a conventional accelerator, right? That's what's happening. So you have some of the issues that we've discussed over here also. Not all of them, but some of them. Uh, for example, how do you decide which code gets executed over here, right? How do you map the data such that this has good access to that? Things like that. Coherence, again, people are actually building coherence mechanisms between CPUs and GPUs. How do you make sure that they work that way? So a lot of the issues exist in accelerators also, and they're solved in some ways. So you can potentially leverage some of those things that are used for these accelerators uh, for, as solutions. But uh, there's this fundamental difference between this accelerator and all of these other accelerators over here, which is this is sitting on the right side of the memory bus. Right? And these are all sitting on the left side of the memory bus, which means that this has very high bandwidth and low latency access to this huge data storage units. Okay, so the key question is what, what else do you want to add over here? I didn't even talk about computation, and we were talk going to talk about processing in memory. I guess processing, data movement can be considered a form of processing. That's fine, but if you talk about computation, usually data movement is not computation. Okay, let's talk about real computation a little bit. What else can you do uh, in memory? And this is really interesting because uh, some of these things you can do really well in some emerging technologies also, maybe better than you can do it in DRAM. Uh, when we get to that, we, we may talk about that. So basically, we know that we can support copy and zero, but you can actually do and, or, not, and majority. And we'll talk about that at low cost. And the key idea is to use the analog computation capability of DRAM. That's actually a little bit similar in uh, emerging technologies, too. So I'll give you the idea right now. But you can activate multiple rows at the same time, and that performs computation for you because of chart sharing. And chart sharing is analog, and if you have a perfect circuit, it's nice computation. And I'll give you some results. Basically, you get, get 30 to 60x performance and energy improvement. And this is a required reading that you need to do. I want you to read not only fundamental papers, but some cutting edge papers also to see where the technology is going. And we'll see. So I'm not going to talk about this right now, but it turns out you can do a lot of these things even more simply in new memory technologies, like memristors, resistor RAM, phase change memory, spin transfer torque MRAM, 
uh, and you can operate uh, on data with minimal movement, even less movement than you do in DRAM, because in DRAM you, uh, you destroy the data that you operate on, right? So you actually have to go through the sense amplifier somehow. You have to go through this movement. Whereas these technologies, whenever you access the data, you're not destroying the data, which means that you, ha you can fundamentally have less data movement whenever you're doing computation. Okay, let's take a look at how you do uh, AND and OR in DRAM. By now you, now, you know exactly how this chart sharing works. Think of an ideal circuit. Uh, again, if you think about the ideal circuit principles, uh, if I tell you that we enable concurrently these three rows, you can tell me what the function would be. <laughs> right. What would be the function that you get on the bit line? So A, B, C, if I concurrently enable them, what happens is they do chart sharing and assume a perfect circuit again. Everything is exactly the same. Uh, and the majority wins. In this case, the majority was, to begin with, two charge cells, right? Because they perturb the bit line toward the positive direction, and this tries to perturb the bit line to the negative direction. But then these guys win because they have more charge together. So basically, the final state is a bitwise majority, which is a beautiful function. Actually, you should read Knuth's fourth edition that talks about the majority function. You know about Donald Kruth's Bible, right? The Art of Computer Programming, which is three, uh, uh, three uh, what do you call them, volumes. But there's a fourth volume also that talks about majority. But this is a beautiful function. Uh, one of the reasons why it's beautiful is you can express and and or as a function of the majority function. Basically, you can take out C with this Boolean equation. And if C is 1, the result that you get on the bit line is the or of A and B. If C is zero, the result you get on the bit line is the and of A and B. Basically, by storing a control value in the C, you can actually do bitwise or and bitwise and. And you can do it at bulk, because remember, this is a row basis, so you're not doing it in a single bit, you're doing it bulk level. So this way, you don't need to add any logic, basically, assuming you make it work. So there's a lot of challenges, of course, at the lower level, at the circuit level, how do you make it work? Okay, so now let's assume we made it work, so you can expose this to the ISA as an instruction that may look like this. Uh, here, basically do a bulk and a bitwise end of two rows, A and B, and store the result in row C. And there are a bunch of implementations that you can follow. For example, you can reserve a row to store only zeros. You can reserve a, zero, a row to store only ones. And you can actually have designated rows for triple activation. So how do you implement this is a key question, right? You don't want to... Uh, have the cost of arbitrarily activating three rows in any part of the subarray, because that requires three row decoders, and row decoders are expensive in DRAM. Uh, so the implementation that's described is you designate a small part of the array, three rows, and you can only concurrently activate those rows. Everything else, no, you cannot concurrently activate. You can do single activation, but you can bring the data from there to these rows to do ending. So that's a simpler design. So the idea is basically you have these designated rows that can be activated triply. So you row clone A into D1. You row clone B into D1 because you want to do actually an end of them. And you row clone R0, all zeros, into D3. Now you have all the data that you need to do a bulk bitwise end of A and B because this is set to zero. And if you remember, if that's set to zero, you get the end of A and B. Okay. And then you activate. Once you activate, all of the data in the designated rows become the result because of charge sharing again. And you need to row clone the result back into the source row. Of course, for this to work, again, your data needs to be nicely mapped in the same subarray. Right. Okay. Cool. Sounds good, right? <laughs> okay. So what we're missing is not... Uh, if you want to have a uh, functionally complete Boolean logic, you cannot just do AND and OR. It would be nice if you could do it. You just need, you need an AND, you need an OR. But AND and OR doesn't satisfy that. Uh, well, you need a NOT, basically, in this case, unless you can do, figure out how to do an AND or an OR by themselves, right? And I don't know how to do that. <laughs> but basically, NOT is harder. Uh, why is it harder? Because it doesn't happen magically. Uh, and you don't want to add inverters because that adds extra cost. But the inverter exists actually in the sense amplifier. The key is basically taking the negated value. So if you activate a row, 
the bit line is the same value as the cell that's connected to uh, the bit line, but this part is bit line bar. That's basically the opposite in the sense amplifier. So you already have the negated value in the sense amplifier, but you don't have the connection from that back into the array. That's the unfortunate part. So if you add that connection with some circuit again like this, and this is called a dual contact cell, people know how to build it, hopefully. <laughs> And that, that way you can capture the destination, uh, the, the negated value in some row. Make sense? So this adds some cost, clearly. But as an architect, never be afraid of cost. Just make sure you minimize it. <laughs> That's the principle here. <laughs> Don't be afraid of cost, because cost is, if you want something, you have to pay for it. And this is the cost of not. Uh, of course, once you have the negated value over here, basically you need to enable this n-word line to get the data into the uh, uh, capacitor of the dual contact cell. Once you already have the negated value over there, you can row clone it to any place. Right. Okay, so you're gonna read this paper, but that's basically the idea. Initially, you activate the source row, which brings the negated value over here, and then uh, you activate uh, the d-word line over here, such that you can capture the negated value here, and uh, uh, later you can copy the data from there to somewhere else. Okay, let's look at the benefits a little bit, uh, just to give you a perspective of what this can buy you. Uh, it's not implementable yet, but you can always do the studies. Archite as an architect, you have to always do the studies. Uh, so this is the throughput of bitwise operations on various systems. These are real systems, Intel Skylake, uh, an old GPU. Uh, but maybe still costly. Uh, so if you look at the throughput, it's about eight giga ops per second in those, if you bring the data into the processor. Now this is hybrid memory cube, which is basically doing the operations in the logic layer, not inside the DRAM. And that already uh, gets you quite a bit. That's about 128, this is not only, 128 giga operations per second. Basically giga uh, knots per second, <laughs> right? Um, but if you actually have this, what's called ambit, basically the mechanism I described, you can, you're almost 4x of that, or 3x of that, whatever it is. But you can also use ambits in the 3D manner. So one of the benefits of this hybrid memory cube, which we're going to talk about, is it has a lot of banks. So you can actually do a lot of these bulk bitwise operations in parallel. Let's say you have 64 banks, and you have all of the subrays in the 64 banks. 64 banks times 64 subrays, 64, 64, and then each subarray is, let's say, eight kilobytes. That's the number you get in a given operation cycle. So if you actually have the same number of banks by having 3D stacking, uh, then you can actually increase the throughput much more. That's, that's about two teraops per second in a single module. Of course, not is much faster. As you do AND and OR, that becomes less fast. And then you can now combine, right? NAND is a combination of AND and NOT but you need to be a little bit intelligent so that you minimize the data movement. You don't want to do a lot of cloning. And then as you become more complicated, your performance goes down, but not a lot. Well, this is it. This is exponential, so it's a lot actually. <laughs> so there's a big difference from two teraops to 512 teraops over here. That's 4x. Okay, so what about energy? Uh, energy is actually much more, as you can see, as expected again. Uh, DDR3, uh, this is the nanojoule per kilobyte cost of a knot. It's about 90. Uh, whereas in, in Ambit, it goes down to 1.6, which is about 60x reduction. And again, as your operations become more complicated, they require more bitwise operations and more copying, uh, your benefit reduces, but this is still a lot, right? This is 25x reduction uh, in the nanojoules per kilobyte. So this gives you an idea of the potential of not moving data, basically. Does that make sense? And all costs are taken into account. So triple row activation, of course, costs more energy, right, in the system. So you need to make it, if you make it too energy costly, then you're going to eat uh, into some of these benefits that you see over here. Okay, so let's take a look at some real application results. Again, as an architect, maybe this is sufficient, but it's good to always examine what's the effect of this on a real application. Again, simulation is your friend here. So you need to simulate. So you take, uh, first of all, you need to find an application. That may be good. One application that's interesting here is using bitmap indices. So a lot of databases uh, 
use bitmap indices as an alternative to B trees and their variants. Basically, the key idea is you, have, you want to do a query across uh, a lot of users, let's say, uh, and how do you do it really fast? One idea is to have bitmaps associated with some characteristics that you want to search on. For example, these are users in the rows, and the columns tell you if this bit is set, the user has age less than 18. If this bit is set, the user has this age, dot, dot, dot. And then you can have another bitmap for which school these people go to, another bitmap for something else, another bitmap for something else, dot, 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 right? Now you can scan, do a column scan, basically, and say, I want the users who are older than, I don't know, 60, and then who go to this school and who earn by this much and who live here. That's a lot of bitwise operations, basically. You do a lot of ending and oring depending on, your pred on the predicate that you're testing in the column scan, right? And if your database is huge, you're doing really a lot of bitwise operations. So, so th th this is one example application that fits this relatively well. And in the paper you're reading, it talks about using mbit for that application. And you can see the ex execution time of a particular query that's in the paper. And you can see this is the data size. As your data size grows, more users and more bits to encode stuff, uh, you basically get significant performance benefits. That's the millisecond execution time for the query. And you get about 5 to 6x reduction in the execution time of the query if you do the bitwise operations inside uh, memory with Ambit. OK, so what else could be useful? Databases are actually good examples for this uh, sort of bitwise operation. So somebody uh, at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Jignesh Patel's group, they built a database called Bitviewing. And their goal was to actually take advantage of uh, the SIMD units, single instruction multiple data units that are very present, uh, very prevalent in existing architectures. So they basically re re recoded the entire database to take advantage of those SIMD units such that most of what you do is bitwise operations in the database. This is really good for column scans that I described, basically like something like this. You select uh, count from a table where uh, you're looking for this kind of comparison. Right? The value is less than C2, some constant, and the value is greater than some other constant, and the value is stored in a table. Right? Now you, may, you have some rows in the database table, and you have some columns in the database table, depending on how many bits you use to encode the value. Uh, and as you have more, co more rows, you need to do more scans. And as you have more columns, then each scan is more expensive. Right? And this is basically the speed up that you get compared to the baseline system, baseline CPU again, uh, with Ambit. So as your data size and data movement requirements increases, your performance benefit increases. So it's about 12x over here for this particular uh, column scan again. So your application clearly needs to take advantage of it. And this paper also assumes that your data is nicely laid out such that you could do these operations. That's always true, actually, with any accelerator. In GPUs, for example, if you don't lay out your data nicely, you get a lot of bank conflicts which people are trying to eliminate. As a result, your performance actually tanks. You really need to optimize your code well and data well. That's not different from this case. This is, again, an accelerator that's good at particular things, but your data needs to, to be laid out well. And who does that is always a question. OK, so that's your required reading. <laughs> Hopefully, it'll be fun. Let's look at the other direction in the last 10 minutes. Basically, we've looked at this minimally changing DM, and I think there's a lot more potential in this area. If you're interested, you should definitely take a look at it. This is going to be big in 20 years. If not, I, I can console you, but <laughs> not with money, hopefully. <laughs> OK, uh, th this is uh, perhaps even more easier. Let's see. Uh, I'm not sure if it's easier any, but at least the technology is almost there. Right? People are putting uh, logic underneath memory. Uh, so th there's an opportunity, basically. Uh, and I already discussed these. So basically, the technology, I don't want to go into the details of the technology, but you can think of the abstraction as you have these long wires that are high bandwidth, uh, where you can move the data from here to here quickly, and hopefully energy efficiently, and, but you can do a lot of this data movement. For example, if you have one row over here, you can get the entire row quickly into the logic layer and do bitwise operations, or whatever you want in the logic layer. Now, the logic layer is free, uh, free in the sense that uh, you can implement a lot of things in the logic layer. You can have an FPGA over here and program it. You can have in-order cores. You can have the difficulty here is you have the logic and you have memory, and they both generate heat. And where does heat go? 
Traditionally, you don't have something on top of the processor so that you can put a heat sink or at least you, things cool down. Now, actually, your heat may get trapped inside it. So as a result, this has not so good thermal properties. So you cannot really arbitrarily put stuff into the logic layer. For example, if you put a really heavy core that consumes a lot of watts, that may be a problem. So people do a lot of analysis to figure out what you can put into this logic layer. So you're still limited by the processing capability, but not as limited as you are inside the DRAM chip. Inside the DRAM chip, if you actually start putting processors and logic, that becomes very complicated. Actually, one of the uh, reasons why, uh, for example, row buffers uh, are much larger is because they're logic, actually. They're not capacitors. They're, the, the size of them is 100 times the size of a single DRAM cell, not only because they need to be strong, but also because they're logic. Uh, similarly with the row decoders. So DRAM manufacturers actually try a lot to optimize it. So you have a similar problem here, but it's not DRAM. Uh, but the problem really comes from the thermals here. OK, that's memory and that's logic. And they're already 3D stacked, or at least 2.5D stacked. There's also 2.5D stacking, which is really not like this. But you put the things like this, but then have an interposer that connects them. So some people think that's actually uh, more viable. And actually, that's how uh, existing GPUs connect uh, uh, high bandwidth memory to the GPU through that interposer. Because if you have a GPU underneath the 3D, uh, under, uh, as the logic underneath memory, then you have a big problem, heat problem. So that's one step. I don't have it over here, 2.5D and, and 3D stack. Uh, if you hear 2.5D, that's what it is, basically. But it's really a step towards 3D, if you will. OK, so they exist. So there are two key questions in 3D stack processing in memory. Uh, whenever you want to design something, it's always good to think about the extremes, right? What is the minimal processing in memory support you can provide without changing the system significantly and while achieving the significant benefits of processing in 3D stack memory? And uh, the second one is, what is the maximal thing you can do? What if we offloaded everything into 3D stacked memory in an important application, for example? Uh, here, we, we don't want to change things. Here, we want to change everything. <laughs> it's always good to explore those two extremes. And I think in DRAM, people have explore, explored the other extreme, which is changing everything in DRAM and putting stuff, a lot of stuff there, but we didn't explore the minimal part, so we talked about that. Uh, the maximal part is not as interesting because of technological reasons. Here, the maximal part is really interesting because technology allows you to enable the maximal. So you can change the architecture and the programming model, and what are the mechanisms for acceleration? Those are key questions. So I'll cover one thing. We're not going to be able to cover uh, the remaining part we'll pick up. But let's talk about this one. So what are the important applications? So it's always good to, whenever you have a new technology, it's always good to have a poster child application. I don't know. Machine learning could be one over here. <laughs> but let's pick graph processing. <laughs> I don't know which one is going to win in the end. I hope they both win. <laughs> but graph processing is interesting, and this is circa 2015. Graphs are everywhere. People use graphs for many, many things. Even genome analysis today, people are actually representing things in graphs. Uh, and the problem is large-scale graph processing is challenging. Uh, and if, if you put more cores to it, you don't gain much. So basically, you increase the, four, the cores by 4x uh, in popular graph processing algorithms, you get 42% speed up and your energy increases a lot. So this is one example of a graph processing kernel. This is PageRank. Uh, you can read the original PageRank paper, actually, to, uh, Google, from Google. This is used to rank pages. That's why it's called PageRank. Uh, but basically, it's a graph processing problem. You basically look at your neighbors and calculate your next rank based on the weight that you have for the neighbors and the rank of the neighbors. That's it. Uh, and it's used in other stuff also, basically, to determine relationships between friends or whatever. Right? OK, I'm not going to go through this. But if you look at the computation here, it's frequent random memory accesses. And you have little amount of computation. Basically, you're moving a lot of cache lines to do this little thing, very similar to what we discussed earlier, uh, which is uh, that, that picture from Bill Daly that I showed you, right? Uh, memory access is 1,000x uh, more costly in terms of energy than this is even a simpler computation, actually. <laughs> Maybe an addition and a, uh, a multiplication and addition over here. OK, so how do you actually uh, fix this? I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can read the paper, which is, not, which is going to be recommended, but not necessarily required at the moment. But basically, uh, how do you design accelerator for this? And I'll give you the key ideas of the accelerator, but there's too much to cover uh, because this changes the programming model and everything. But think about a host processor offloading 
a big graph into an accelerator that looks like this. You can think of this as a GPU-like accelerator, as you mentioned earlier, for example. Uh, it's non-cacheable, physically addressed, dot, dot, dot. Basically, there's no virtual memory here, and processor basically ensures that there's nothing inside the caches from this graph. So we're going to start with this building block, which is 3D stack memory. And if you look at 3D stack memory, internally, it's divided into these partitioned into what's called the vaults. So there's a vault over here. And you have a vault controller that looks like this that controls the stack on top of it. So you can actually do whatever to the memory uh, on top of you as you're the vault controller. And these vaults are, vault controller are connected with a crossbar network. Again, we're going to talk, going to talk about the networks. It doesn't need to be crossbar, but crossbar is good for connectivity. Uh, uh, and they can communicate with each other. So let's take a look at the internals of this. So what we're going to add to the vault controller is a simple in-order core, such that it can do processing. And we're going to add a bunch of other things. This has to have a DRAM controller to control the DRAM on top of it, and a network interface so that it can communicate with the other vault controllers over here. And we're going to change the programming model because we don't want to have coherence over here. We just want to do messaging. With messaging, a message passing programming model, you can send a message to another core, and the core can execute it, do, do functions for you. That's good for actually, a lot of distributed systems are actually programmed this way. You can send remote procedure calls, and, peop, uh, and the uh, machine on the other end executes that procedure call for you, right? It's not different from what that, what that is. Uh, so basically, you can communicate via remote function calls, and the message gets buffered to the remote node that you're sending the message to. So how do you know which message, you, uh, where, where to send the message? Basically, which part of the graph you're operating on determines which core over here to send the message to. And there are some prefetching mechanisms also. So let's look at the large scale over here also, because this vault, uh, this, this is small. For a large graph, you really need many of these, and you basically interconnect a bunch of these together. It's like a multiprocessor, right? This is like a multiprocessor inside, but then there's a multiprocessor of multiprocessors, except each processor is really underneath a memory that it can operate on. So you lay out the graph, which is a challenging problem by itself. How do you partition the graph to actually get the best out of it? In general, graph partitioning is hard. Uh, but basically, let's assume that you partition it. If, you, if this core wants to operate on this node, then it sends a message to that node. And that node actually does the operation and sends it back. That's how things work. So you can read the paper for more detail. And there are some prefetching mechanisms to ensure that the huge amounts of bandwidth that's available to the core doesn't go wasted. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at uh, the performance potential of it, and then we're going to conclude. Basically, this is a DDR3-based system. That's the bandwidth you get available to the cores. This is hybrid memory cube. That's the bandwidth you get to the, available to the cores. Much higher, but the paradigm is the same. Uh, it's still von Neumann. Whereas m this is a many-core architecture, so that we can see the difference between 32 out-of-order cores here with 512 in-order cores. And this is test rack. It looks very different, clearly, because there is no memory and... Uh, Compute separation. Here, you're really bottlenecked by the external links over here. Uh, as a result, you get 640 gigabytes per second available to the processors. Here, you have 8 terabytes per second available to the processors because you're directly connected uh, through the true silicon VS. But your bottlenecks are really inter-hybrid memory cube connections, inter-chip connections, basically. Okay, so I'll give you some performance and energy results. Uh, basically, these are the systems over here, the three systems, conventional systems. They're all in the similar ballpark. In fact, if you make your cores uh, not so good, you actually lose performance. 32 out-of-order cores, 512 in-order cores, you lose performance. This is 56% benefit compared to DDR3. This is 25% benefit only. So actually, there are some latency benefits for in-order cores, tolerance benefits. So Tesseract, without prefetching, already gives you 9x. Uh, and with prefetching, you get even more, actually. And the reason is you can actually exploit the bandwidth. And also, your energy reduction is significant uh, with something like this. So it's basically 8x reduction in energy. So hopefully, this gives you an idea of what if you change everything in this. Well, I did, I, I'm not going to claim that this is the best you can do. I don't think this is the best you can do. But this is somewhere better than <laughs> the minimal you can do for sure. And it's probably closer to the be best you can do. Uh, actually, there's some analysis that shows that some of, uh, a lot of your benefits come from the bandwidth. But a lot of your benefit also comes from the programming model and how you actually do this. And you can read the paper uh, for more detail. So next time, we'll continue this, but we're going to look at this minimal part, and then we'll explore other directions. Any burning questions? Okay.
I'll see you next week.